Hey guys. This is part 2 of what if Naruto was Luffy's sister. Hit like and subscribe if you like this one and also please check the author in the description. Let's start. We are pain, that's all. We are God. <laughs> Chapter 6, Shidmatsuki Kozaburo and Ueno Nara didn't know what to expect when she decided to follow this strange old man back to his residence. Being mistaken as someone from this place called Ueno wasn't what she expected either. He sounded so sure about that, that it took her a few moments to recover from her dumbfounded-like state as she stood there with a stupid look on her face. She failed to understand as to why this old man thought that she came from somewhere that she had never even heard of before. The man had yet said anything to explain more when he just chuckled and continued on heading back to the village. Realizing that she was being left behind, Nera quickly followed after him. Since it was already late at night, the village was even more quiet now. The two kept on walking until they reached a traditional-looking residence that reminded her of those houses that belonged to the clans in Kanoha. Like the Hyuga, for example. Although it didn't look like it could fit more than fifty people inside, it was still bigger than the rest of the houses that she had seen around the village. This old man Kozaburo was probably an important person here. He did share the same name as the village after all. When they arrived at the front door, they were greeted by another man who was wearing round glasses that later introduced himself as Kushiru. Like the old man, he was also wearing a traditional yukata. Apparently, he was the old man's only son, and he also had a daughter who was a year younger than Nera herself. Despite the curiosity over her sudden appearance, he didn't say anything and only offered her a polite smile as he invited her into their home. Inside the living room, there were only Nehru and the old man sitting across each other on the floor with a short table between them. There were also two cups of hot tea and some snacks that had been prepared by Kushiro-san earlier, before he left them alone. Unlike the old man who calmly drank his tea, Nehru was too busy with her inner thoughts to even bring herself to care about ethics. She only sat there with a troubled mind as she stared at the old man. He didn't seem like he would be opening his mouth to start a conversation first. Nobody could blame her for being like this. Other than possessing the same internal energy as hers, he was also able to detect Karama's presence within her that easily. She couldn't believe that he was able to detect the fox's presence just because of a small chakra flare. Did he possess a sensory ability? Or did he use Kenbunsha Kahaki like she was told by Garp before to sense her in Karama? She was itching to just ask him about who he really was. Was he the same as her? A reincarnated soul? But what if he wasn't? What if there was actually a place like the elemental nations out there, and people there could use chakra like she did? What if Weno was actually the elemental nation but only with a different name? Perhaps that explained why Karama and her could feel the familiar chakra presence from him. But was it even a chakra? Or just something similar? Or maybe this guy didn't exactly have chakra, but possessed the same kind of energy like chakra instead? With this world's strangeness, she wouldn't be surprised if that was really the case. But what if she was completely wrong about the whole reborn into a different world kind of thing? After all, the only reason why she thought of it that way was because of the lack of chakra presence here and also the foreign language spoken by everyone else. But now that this guy appeared, so maybe she did reborn, but somewhere outside of elemental nations that she was completely unaware of. The former ninja of Kanoha was truly confused. Before she could create another what-if scenario inside of her head, she heard a slight coughing, snapping her out of her train of thoughts. She looked over to see the old man putting down the half-empty cup of tea, and finally took a good look at her. His eyes lingered on her cheeks for a while no doubt looking at the faint whisker marks on her face. Then he looked straight into her eyes as if to look for something. Nodding his head, he asked, So tell me, young one, how did you even end up here in the East Blue? You really think that I am not from around here? She asked him slowly. What makes you think that I wasn't born and raised here, old man? I'm telling you now, I am seriously not from wherever you thought I was from Tobeo. But I can clearly feel the strong energy of Ryo coming from you. He frowned. And by the looks of it, you're quite proficient in using it to your advantage. Not many people can do that, especially a child at your age. 
Tell me, child, are you perhaps a kunoichi in training? Her heart skipped at the kunoichi part. He knew about it. But wait, he said Ryo before. Not chakra. So what did this mean? Was he someone like her? Or a place like the elemental nations did exist here and the people there possessed the same energy like chakra but they called it Ryo? Still too early to make her conclusion, she still confirmed his suspicion anyway. So what if I am? There was no point in trying to deny this. She might as well just go straight to the point. I am indeed a kunoichi. But I am also not from this place called Ueno. I don't even know what is this Ryo. No matter what kind of similarities that I share with your people, it will not change the fact that I am 100% born and raised here in East Blue. Ueno? This is the first time I heard of it. Staring hard at the child who also returned his staring with one of her own, he wondered if he was being too rash in claiming her to be someone from his homeland. But he indeed felt the same internal energy from her. And it was so dense and strong that he thought that she was one of those capable men from his country. But when he chose to follow the unwanted visitor, all he saw was a child. Because of the Ryo presence within her, he decided to follow her and observe. He saw how she walked around his village with a look of wonder, meeting the kid that he was quite familiar with, how she treated the younger child to some warm meals, and how she demonstrated a skill that Kozaburo had often seen those arrogant ninjas from his country always did to show off their skills. Because of what he saw, the thought of her being someone from his country was not so strange after all. When he realized that her presence was nowhere near the village anymore, he used his own Ryo and sensed that she was somewhere in the mountain. He followed her, and the sight of the girl who seemed like she was talking to someone made him so confused as he didn't feel anyone else but her in that area. But when he used his Ryo to sense the surroundings once again, imagine his surprise when he felt the warm energy of the girl. But once he detected a dark and sinister presence within her, he couldn't help but to grimace and worry. He was sure that the second presence did not belong to her at all. The sight of the girl talking out loud and the second presence within her made him think that there was something bad residing within her. Karama was what she called it. He didn't know what kind of creature or entity could be living inside a young child, but he didn't want to take the risk. However, he was willing to let them go if they had no ill intention towards this place. He only wanted to confirm whether the child was truly from Ueno or not. After all, it had been so long since he had left that place. No matter how much time had passed since he left Ueno, he still had that sense of loyalty towards his country. But the child herself denied being from Ueno, causing a little bit of disappointment in his old heart. Now that the answer was already said, he had no reason to continue questioning her about it. Plus, she said her name was Monkey D. Neru, which meant that it was a very high possibility that she was related to a certain Marine Vice Admiral. But still... To see someone who could use the skills of a ninja and even possess the internal energy of his people was truly interesting. As expected of someone from the family of D. Seeing that the man had been zoning out for a while now, Nero was a little bit worried that he might not believe in her words. So she tried to convince him once again. Everything that I said was the truth to Bayo. I've never set foot outside of East Blue yet. So how could I know about this Wayno? Yet? he questioned, before coming into a realization. You wish to go to the Grand Line, child? Yes, she admitted. The Grand Line is a very dangerous place, he stated. But I believe that someone with your potential might be able to achieve something big out there. You don't seem to be the kind of person who would just sit back with no ambition. A little bit surprised at being supported by a total stranger, she was also a little bit touched. This was the first time she ever admitted or let someone else know of her plan on going to the Grand Line. Sure, she didn't need anyone's opinion to make her decision, but it was nice to have someone to support your ambition, you know? Of course, she also knew that her siblings would support her, but that besides the point. As for Kozaburo himself, seeing that his little comment made her glow in satisfaction, he didn't know how right he was when he said that she would achieve something big in the future especially once he saw a shocking article about the things that she did to be considered as the world government's number one enemy. For now, she was just a nameless nobody from the weakest sea. Um, so do you believe in me now, old man? She asked again. Hmm, now that I think about it, 
He paused as an image of a certain man appeared in his head. Your name sounds familiar. Are you perhaps related to Monkey D. Garp? Oh, he's my grandfather. She admitted it easily, thinking that he probably believed her now, and since he looked like he was not going to press her for any information about herself anymore, she thought that now was the time for her to get her answers. So old man, about. Your companion? She nodded. He didn't answer immediately. Instead he took his own sweet time picking up the half-empty cup of tea and took a sip. A few sips later, he put down the now-empty cup and looked at her. Imagine seeing someone talking to nothing but air, and at the same time you feel two different kind of presences in one vessel. Um, that was it? To be honest, as long as there is no harm done to this village, I do not mind whoever or whatever it is that is currently residing within you he said lightly, but Nero could clearly hear the warning and threat in his voice. She could understand him at least. My partner is not a bad person, Nero stated confidently, nor do we have any ill intentions towards this place. I believe you. He nodded calmly much to her surprise and said nothing more. Nero was stupefied to say the least. They were merely strangers to each other, but he already trusted her this much? Not that she wasn't grateful, but seriously? This old man didn't even hesitate to claim her as someone from his country, and now he could be careless about Karama? Shouldn't he be a little bit curious? Even Karama felt a little bit offended for being brushed off like he was no big deal. May whatever. As long as everything was good. But just to be sure you're really not gonna ask anything about me anymore? I am already this old. It's better to just stay away from troublesome things like this. He sighed. You can say that I know exactly who to trust and which one is good or else I wouldn't have survived until now. Nero wasn't sure, but for just a moment she could clearly see the gaze of a warrior from old man Kozaburo's eyes. Well, someone with an aura like him would surely be nothing else but a warrior, right? What was he? A ninja? So, old man. Since you already mentioned this way, no. She started slowly. Seeing no objection from the old man across from her, she continued, Will you tell me more about it? Who knows, maybe one day, I'll visit your hometown. And what exactly is this Ryo, if you don't mind me asking? You really want to know? She nodded. He stared at her for a good moment before he shifted his gaze away from her to look at something behind her. With curiosity, she also turned her head to see what was behind her, only to see a long sword placed neatly on the wall. Nero was never an expert in weapons. The only weapon she would always use in most of her battles was a kanai. So to say that she didn't know how to appreciate and describe the beauty of a weapon like this sword was not wrong. In her eyes, it just looked like a normal sword with some diamond-shaped patterns on its white hilt. The sheath of the sword was painted white. But now, no matter how simple-looking the sword was in her eyes, she could clearly see the immense pride in old man Kozaburo's eyes. That sword is called the Wado Ikemanji. I was the one who crafted it back when I was still living in Wano. He let out a sigh after that. I have another one called Enma, but since it couldn't be wielded, I left it behind, hoping that someone will be able to actually wield it. A sword that can't be used? That's weird. She thought to herself. Since you want to go to the Grand Line, I presume you should at least have some knowledge of it, right? He asked her. She nodded. Well, I know what most people know. Did you know that the Grand Line is divided into two parts? He asked, and she nodded her head once again. Good, then I won't explain about that. Wayno is precisely located in the New World. Based on what Garp had told her once, the New World was a term used by the people here to refer to the second half of the Grand Line. Only strong and capable individuals that were able to survive the so-called Paradise could go there. Most of the highly dangerous pirates like the emperors were there. Kozaburo continued. Wano is a country where it doesn't bother itself with the outside world. It is also not affiliated with the world government, which makes it a free country. Being a closed country it is, the act of having any contact with other countries and outsiders, especially pirates, is considered a crime. That's why. He sighed and looked at her with a pair of tired eyes. The moment you step foot inside the border, you'll surely get attacked. For a moment, Nera didn't know what to say when she saw how tired he suddenly looked. 
She could feel that there was more that he wanted to say, but he hesitated. Do you want to visit your country, old man? She asked. It's been decades since I last heard about that place. He chuckled. Just like how the people of Wayno find it hard to get any news of the outside world, the same goes to the outside world too. We practiced isolationism pretty well. Plus, with my old age, it is better for me to just stay here. My prime has already ended when I had a family of my own. Nera blinked at him for a few moments before she suddenly broke into a smile. Well then, one day, I'll visit Wayno country on your behalf. You. Nair gave him a small smile before she said my main reason for going to the Grand Line is because I want to see the world. And I have decided that Wayno will be one of the places that I shall visit in the future. So simply, a traveling journey? He was taken aback for a while before he laughed out loud. Oh child, if only fate would let you be on your own way, he thought. Hey, I'm serious. She glared at him. Please forgive my rudeness, he said. Then, why don't I tell you more about Wayno? Nera nodded excitedly. Sure. And he did tell her more about it. He told her about the people and the cultures in Wayno. The more she listened, the more she felt that this Wayno was very similar to the elemental nations. The only difference was that most of the people there were samurai. There were also ninjas, but unlike the elemental nation, there was no such thing as hidden villages there, much to her surprise. Old man Kozabura described his homeland with immense pride in his eyes that she couldn't wait to go to Wayno herself. So, what is this Ryo again? She asked curiously. The old man still hadn't answered her question regarding this subject when she asked earlier. Ryo is what we call the internal energy that is flowing from within our body. He explained. However, it seems that only my people possess Ryo in them. People here do not have the exact internal energy except maybe for you. Nera said nothing. She figured that her chakra had been mistaken as Ryo by this old man. He continued, Yours is very warm, and so dense. That's why I was very surprised when you said that you're not from Wayno. What if the thing that I have is just hockey? He gave a small chuckle. Very impossible, child. And why is that? I am the most familiar of what a true Ryo and hockey feel like. Haki does not have the strong feeling as Ryo, and how we utilize them is also different. Just like how you use your own internal energy to perform such a great display of the Shunshin, that is exactly how the ninjas in my homeland did it. Can you do something else besides that? Neru immediately crossed her fingers, and a clone appeared next to her. Both were looking expectantly at the pleasantly surprised Kozaburo. Marvelous! He praised her. See! That's how we use Ryo. I'm not sure if you know this, but hockey is used differently than how we use Ryo. In Wayno, we always use Ryo to our advantage for many things, while the people here use their hockey only for two purposes. Enhancing and observation. I'm aware of it. Kozaburo raised his eyebrow at her. My grandfather taught me about it before. He nodded. No wonder. In the end they talked until it was almost the time for the sun to rise. Old man Kozaburo kindly let her stay here in one of the guest bedrooms since he was aware that she didn't have any place to stay as long as she was here. Despite only having a couple of hours to sleep, Nero woke up like usual. Since the bedroom was connected to a personal bathroom, she took a quick shower and got dressed. She had all of her personal belongings kept inside her storage seal which was very convenient since she didn't have to carry a bag all the time. Staring at her reflection in the mirror, she tied her hair into the usual high ponytail. Checking her appearance for one last time to make sure that she was neat enough, she then hummed in satisfaction before heading towards the door, immediately leaving the room. As soon as she left the room, she encountered Kushiro who was about to leave. After they greeted each other politely, they heard footsteps coming from behind the man. Both turned their heads and saw a little girl staring at her curiously. Father. She greeted Kushira first. The man nodded and then he introduced both girls to each other. Narasan, this is my daughter, Kuina. The girl, Kuina, bowed at the mention of her name. Kuina, this is Narasan. She is a year older than you and will be staying here for the time being. Nara blinked at him. I am? 
Kushiri just smiled and nodded in confirmation as he said father has already informed me earlier. Therefore, Narasan, please be at ease and just make yourself comfortable around here. You can just call me without that honorific, you know? Nara said. After all, you're the elder. It's not a problem at all. He laughed softly, before smiling apologetically at her. We would like to stay longer and talk to you, but we need to head out to the dojo now. Oh, it's fine. I was about to head out and explore the village anyway. She responded, thinking whether Zoro was already at where they promised to meet or not. While they were talking, Kuina had been staring at her quietly, making Neru a little bit uncomfortable for being stared so openly like that. What exactly is she staring at me for? Nera grimaced mentally. Well then, we'll go out first. With that, the father and daughter duo finally left. Not long after that, Nera used Shunshin to leave the place, leaving behind several green leaves at the spot that she once stood. Arriving exactly at the place where she met Zoro yesterday, she saw the boy sitting on the same spot she found him last night, playing with the grass. Well, more like pulling out the grass aggressively. Obviously the kid was not in a good mood for some reasons. Well someone seems to be in a bad mood this morning. She stated once she appeared from out of nowhere right next to him, causing the poor boy to move backwards until his back made contact with the hard surface of the tree as he grasped his chest dramatically, much to her amusement. It's you! He exclaimed, pointing a trembling finger at her. How did you do that? Feigning ignorance, she asked do what? Do that. Like I said, do what? How did you just disappear yesterday? You were even jumping across the roofs like it was nothing. Although he was still as shocked as he appeared yesterday, Nera could still see the amazement in his eyes. He kind of reminded her of when both Ace and Luffy reacted when she demonstrated some of her abilities. Feeling a little bit mischievous this morning, she leaned forward and asked in a cheerful tone, Do you really want to know? He nodded thinking that she would really show him the secrets behind her tricks. However, he wasn't prepared to see her small smile become wider as her eyes became bigger and rounder, as she leaned closer to him, and said more like whispering than I have no choice but to kill you after this. The sudden feeling of fear that crept into his small heart almost made him believe that she would truly do something bad to him, if she hadn't broken into a fit of laughter a few moments after that. Realizing that he was actually being teased by the older girl, he immediately scowled at her. Why you? Ah ha ha ha. You should have seen the look on your face. Her laughter only caused him to be more annoyed, but that didn't mean that the fear of her had gone yet. Man, she's really scary. He thought to himself. Once she was done laughing her ass off, she plopped herself next to him. They didn't talk for a while as Zoro refused to talk to her. She only smiled at his childish behavior and thought that Zoro was really fun to tease. Then she decided to open her mouth. What's wrong? Why are you so angry on such a fine day? Come on, you can tell me. Zoro just looked at her for a good moment, not saying anything. Nera didn't give up. What's up? Sometimes it's okay to tell others about your problems instead of keeping everything to yourself. But if you don't want to tell me, then it's fine too. As long as you're okay now. Nobody could blame her for being such a soft. Having to take care of children for almost eight years, Nera was quite sensitive when it came to children. Even though she just met this Zoro kid yesterday, he already had a special place in her heart. That's because he reminds you of the old you, Karama remarked. Maybe. Nera didn't deny his words. Zoro lowered his head at her words. Yes, he was angry. He was angry because earlier, the other kids wouldn't stop making fun of him. The thing about him being mocked was that he was already getting used to it. But when that fatty Sutta said that he would never get adopted and accepted because of his weird hair color, he was angrier than usual. So what did he do? He punched him. Watching that fat kid cried until he became uglier brought a sense of satisfaction to his heart. Zoro didn't even feel anything when the patrons were scolding him and only listened to Suda's stupid cries. They didn't even try to listen to him. Not that he tried to explain anything either, because why bother explaining when he knew that they wouldn't listen to him anyway? So he just dashed out of there until he reached the place where he met the weird girl yesterday. He didn't even know why he even came. 
but when he remembered the kindness shown by a stranger and the promise they made about meeting each other here again, next thing he knew he was already here. But when he arrived he didn't see her at all. Well, it was to be expected. Why would anyone pay any attention to a random orphan like him anyway? No one. He didn't realize it yet, but even a little bit of expectation could lead to a bigger disappointment. Since he was already in a bad mood, he started to pull out the innocent grasses around him out of frustration. Because it reminded him of why he was refused, and being mocked in the first place. Only for her to suddenly appear from out of nowhere, just like how she disappeared into the thin air yesterday. After a few moments of hesitation, he took a deep breath and grumbled there's a fat kid making fun of me. Why? Because my hair is green. He frowned. That's it. Nera blinked her eyes at him. Taken aback by her casual reaction, Sora looked at her as if she was crazy. I have green hair. He emphasized the word green while staring at her expectantly as if to say that this hair color was not normal, because he was the only one in the village to have an abnormal hair color. Others had brown or black hair. Elderly people had white hair, but that was because they were old. So to say that his color was not normal was not wrong either. Well, I know someone whose hair is the color of an orange. There's a guy that I know who has natural red hair, even his beard is red. And I've seen some people with yellow hair, and sometimes blue as well. Now that I look at your hair, an older girl I know has green hair too. Only yours is brighter. She nodded at herself. So yeah, I don't think your hair color is weird or anything, because out there, there are more people with unimaginable features. The world is very huge, Zoro. You and the rest of the villagers just haven't explored it yet. Zoro was speechless. Are really? Are there actually people with such hair colors? She nodded, and he was even more surprised. By now, she could already guess why he was that upset. Discrimination against those who were different than the rest? Yeah, she was quite familiar with it. Society would always be like that especially when they were so used to staying the same and afraid of things that were completely different. Hey. Nera suddenly touched his head and said you shouldn't let other people's opinion get into your head. The only reason why they're messing with you is because they don't have the thing that only you have. And also because they haven't seen the world outside of this island yet. So be confident in yourself, no matter what other people say. But. I think you look fine just the way you are. She flashed him a smile. Amused with his embarrassed look, she ruffled his hair. She really meant what she said, though. Why bother to care about other people's opinion? As an adult, mentally, Nera simply didn't give a fuck if anyone wanted to judge her. As someone who used to live half of her short life being judged all the time in Kanoha, Nera could more or less understand this Zoro kid here. You're right, Zoro said suddenly. Then he said nothing afterwards. She guessed that whatever it was that was bothering him didn't matter to him anymore. After that, she spent the rest of the evening introducing him to some games that she always played with her brothers. Less extreme, of course. She even taught him some simple exercises that he could do to improve his stamina. Seriously, she played tag with him and the boy didn't even last for more than ten minutes. Sending him to the orphanage turned out to be easier than yesterday. She didn't use any fancy ninja tricks this time around. Instead, she just walked him there. Then she shunshined herself back to the Shimatsuki's residence, appearing right in front of the door. You a voice appeared from behind her, startling her. Just her luck to display her ninja trick right in front of someone, right? Kuina. Nera tried to be as cheerful as possible as she smiled at the shorter girl with a big smile on her face. What's up? How did you before she could even finish her question, the door suddenly opened, revealing old man Kozaburo. You're back, he said, looking at Karina. Yes, Grandpa. She bowed to him in greeting after looking away from Neru. I'll go inside now. Sending one last glance at the older girl, Karina went inside the house. Nera sighed. It wasn't like she wanted to hide her abilities or anything, but she was just surprised. Maybe later if the younger girl could be a little bit friendlier, they could be friends. Old man Kozaburo stared at her and said it must be nice to be able to transport to wherever you want just by using a simple jutsu. You can't. 
she blinked at him. I am what you can call a mere samurai, he simply said. So you're saying that you can't use shunshin? One will stay true to one's occupation and role, he said once again, before he turned his body around and entered the house. Are you planning to sleep outside? Huh. Seeing her responding like a dumb person, he proceeded to close the door, and before he could close it fully, Nero immediately dashed inside. Ma, you can't just leave your guest outside. She pouted, earning a chuckle from him. After that, Nero decided to stay there for another three days before she decided to return back to Dawn Island. Since she had already obtained more detailed information of Wano and the grand line that Garp didn't tell her about, there was no more reason for her to stay here. Thus, after telling old man Kozaburo that she would be leaving soon, she went off to find Zoro and tell him the same thing. During her stay here, she had been treating Zoro just like what Kurama would call a kin. The kid himself wasn't that unhappy with the idea of becoming her younger brother figure or younger friend. He wouldn't admit it, but he had already considered Nero to be his close friend. So the little guy was reluctant with her leaving, even though he didn't show it. As for Kuina, the day after Nero accidentally shunchoned herself in front of the younger girl, Kuina confronted her herself. Are you a Kunoichi? Yeah, you can say that. Nero nodded. There was no harm in admitting to old man Kozaburo's own granddaughter anyway. For a brief moment, she saw the younger girl's eyes lit up. Can you use a sword? She asked suddenly. As a Kunoichi, you should at least be able to use a sword, right? Did this brat just challenge her? She's not wrong, though. Kurama suddenly spoke, in which she replied back with a shut up. A I can use it. How hard could it be? All she had to do was swing to attack, defense, and dodge right? Kuina then went off to retrieve a couple of wooden swords that were used for practice purposes. She tossed one at her before simply getting into a stance like a proper swordsman in training. This was really challenging her, wasn't it? Long story short, Kuina lost. For the girl's credit, she had a good foundation and training. She was at least a lot better than any academy students. But to defeat Nero who had been training her body since a young age under the extreme training with Garp, combined with her past battle experiences, it was simply impossible for Kuina. Not that Nero used any fancy tricks or anything. She simply used her speed and brute strength a little bit. Kuina lost as soon as the older girl used an unbelievable speed towards her. And when she felt that her wooden sword was knocked out of her grip, she knew that she lost. But instead of being upset, she broke into a wide grin as her eyes lit up even more. Kuina even asked Nero for some pointers after that. Her pointers? Don't give up, and keep practicing to swing your sword even faster. A lousy pointer but hey, she wasn't a kenjutsu user in the first place, okay? Her main weapons were her kunai and limbs alone. After that, they became a lot closer. But unlike Zoro, she didn't spend that much time with Kuina since the girl herself still needed to go to the dojo to practice her own swordsmanship. On the day she was about to leave, she didn't let them send her off. They simply said their farewells at the entrance of the Shimatsuki's residence. Old man Kozaburo just nodded at her, as Kushiru and Kuina welcomed her back any time she'd come to visit. Zoro did come to send her off at the village's entrance though. After a little farewell, a little talk and a promise to visit again sometime in the future, she went back to the beach where she first arrived, unsealed her tiny boat, and sailed away. Her journey to Dawn Island was smooth. This time, she didn't get lost, thanks to Kushiro who was kind enough to teach her how to read a map and use the compass correctly. It didn't take long for her to reach the island this time. Once she reached the shore, she sealed back her boat, and she immediately went back to the mountain. When she reached the house, she saw some of the bandits were busy making fire at where they usually grill meat. Next to them were a couple of dead animals that would be roasted later on. Seeing that she was back, the others immediately greeted her and welcomed her back with a warm smile as they inquired about her first journey. They laughed and teased her when she told them that she lost the compass, causing her to glare at them playfully. Thinking that she might be tired from such a long journey, Magra told her to take a rest and let them prepare dinner. Nero just went along with his words and entered the house, only to see Dayton folding some clothes. 
Despite acting like a rough man, she was quite diligent in keeping everything around the house as neat and clean as possible. I'm home, Nera said. Dayton just gave a small HN and said I thought you had already forgotten the way back home. Nera looked around the house and noticed that her brothers were not here. Come one, it wasn't even that long. Where are those two? As usual. Lately, they've been spending a lot of time in the woods, Dayton said. Usually, they would only return once it was already late at night. At night? Yeah. Well, I guess they need a good scolding from me once they are back, she said with a smile. Seeing that she was about to enter her room, Dayton asked are you not going to find them? Neri just waved her hand and said don't worry. They will come back anyway. Dayton just shook her head and minded her own business. Anyway, those kids would be fine. Once Nera entered her room and closed the door, she summoned a clone and sent it to track where those two brats were currently at. When her clone finally found them, Nera was surprised to know that her brothers were playing around in the deeper part of the woods, which was quite near the Great Terminal. It wasn't just the two of them, though. It seemed that while she was gone, Ace and Luffy had made a new friend. And she instantly recognized her brother's new friend as that one kid who came from a toxic rich family. Because of her spy network and her constant breaking and entering the highest noble houses in Goa Kingdom, for research purposes of course, she was actually quite familiar with the nobles around here. While she didn't remember their names, she still remembered their faces. And one of them was exactly the boy who was currently playing around with her brothers. Since Nera was aware of the shitty attitudes of the rich people here, she was surprised and also amused to see a son of a noble to be covered in mud with a smile on his face instead of enjoying his wealth and high status in his own mansion. Oh well. Since they were having fun at the moment, she would just let them be. There was no harm in making a new friend after all. Later, when the brothers returned back after hours of playing around with Sabo, they were met with the sight of their older sister standing in front of the front door with her arms crossed. There was a look that clearly said that they were both in trouble. Oh boy. Ace thought nervously, and immediately went into a defensive mode upon seeing that look as he knew that angry Nero was a scary Nero. Luffy with his oblivious nature just went straight towards her to give her a hug with a huge smile on his face. You're back. We missed you so much. Did you know that me and Ace found this really cool place with junks all around it, and we met Sabo? He said he lives there alone but I don't believe him like how could he live there alone. Oh then we became friends and we played and Sabo showed us this really cool trick he does with his staff. Can I get a staff too? I want a cool and big one. Ace already found one for himself but he only told me to find one myself. Yesterday, I ate this weird mushroom that made me feel funny. It doesn't taste good either. And then. She closed his mouth with one hand. It seemed that they had done a lot of things while she was gone. Chapter 7 Finally to the Grand Line Time skip, two years later. Another one, Makino. A loud voice called out. Here you go. Makino, the bartender and also the owner of the bar, placed another glass of milk in front of a grinning boy with unruly hair. It's quite rare to see you here all alone, Luffy. The dark, green-haired woman commented with her usual smile. It was a well-known fact among the people of Fusha village of how the youngest grandkid of Gok could always be seen with either his big sister or one of his big brothers. The eldest had always been very protective of her brothers since she was the one responsible for them if Garp wasn't around due to his busy marine work. However, the girl hadn't been seen for quite some time now. Nechan went somewhere, and both Ace and Sabo are busy doing something without me again. They didn't even wake me up this morning. Luffy complained. For the past two years, Luffy had been growing up well with his siblings. He was almost seven while both Ace and Sabo were almost ten years old. Nero was older, and she was already twelve, and also had been sailing everywhere with her pet. Each time she left the island, her journey would last longer than her previous one. This time, she had just left a week ago, and who knew how long her journey would be this time. Because of that, she had been spending less time with the boys. Even Ace and Sable were often doing something without him. Luffy was frustrated and started to think that maybe he was being left out by the older ones because he was the baby of the group. When he woke up this morning, 
Ace and Sable were nowhere to be seen, which meant that they had already woken up earlier than he did and decided to have fun without him. Again. Angry, Luffy decided to go down the mountain on his own accord despite being advised by his older sister that he shouldn't go alone. But she only gave him advice, not an order. So he went to visit Makino. The woman was someone that was brought in by Garp himself to look after the boys sometimes after knowing that Nero had been leaving the island quite often these days. He didn't try to stop her of course, since he knew more than anyone else of how capable Nero actually was. His only hope was that she wouldn't cause any trouble like her father did. Thus, when Nero was not around, the girl's responsibility to look after the boys became Makino's instead. The woman herself was quite familiar with the blue-eyed girl. Makino was only seven years older than Nehru and she had also watched Nehru grow up from the toddler that had always been carried around on Garp's shoulders, to a stunning young lady. Therefore, she was what the people could say, a close acquaintance of the four kids. Still, coming here alone is not very safe. There's been a lot of bandits from other mountains around here lately. Makino warned the boy softly. And Nerachan would probably scold you later for this. With the mention of his older sister, he shivered when the image of an angry Nera popped up inside his head. Somehow, she often seemed to know everything about what he did even though she wasn't here to witness it. It was like she had the power to see his every movement. But even if she did, he wouldn't even be surprised. Because to him, Nera was simply a magician who could make things appear and disappear as well as walking across the water. How amazing was that? But he was told to keep it a secret and Luffy treated her words very seriously. It's fine. I'm strong, so I can beat them up myself. I don't even need Nechan, Ace and Sabo to protect me, he claimed. Makino just shook her head helplessly. It might seem like boastful empty talk coming from the almost seven years old kiddo, but Luffy grew up witnessing the strength of his older family members to the point where he sometimes suffered from it, Garp. He grew up surviving the wilderness every single day, and he even suffered his grandpa's merciless training with his siblings. Even though most of the time, it was him who was being attacked instead of attacking, Nechan said that he was getting better at dodging. His body was way stronger than the average kid's. He managed to survive grandpa's horrifying fist of love, so he was strong. At least that was what he thought anyway. He still couldn't be compared to the strength of his older brothers let alone a monster like his sister who could already fight one-on-one -on -one against their merciless grandfather. But Luffy wasn't disheartened by the fact that he was the weakest of the four. In fact, he made it a goal to beat them all one day. So in conclusion, he was confident enough to not get himself killed by some bandits. Plus, with a certain someone's disguised clones everywhere on Dawn Island to keep an eye out for any future troubles, there was no way that something terrible would happen to him. Not that he knew that, of course. Sometime later, while Luffy was busy stuffing food into his mouth, the main door of the bar was suddenly being pushed open and a bunch of people he didn't recognize entered the bar in a big group. A smiling man with an eye-catching red hair wearing a straw hat caught his attention as the man cheerfully led the others inside the bar. The local people inside the bar recognized them as the pirate crew who had arrived yesterday to get some supplies. Since they were not that bad, and friendly to talk to, the people immediately greeted them as Makino herself politely led them to some empty tables since there weren't that many customers at this hour. As for Luffy, this was the first time he met a pirate crew. Even though they didn't look that strong, nevertheless, as someone who wanted to be a pirate one day, he was quite excited to see them. Wasn't it good that he chose to come here today? He met a pirate crew. Hence, without any thought, Luffy just went straight up to them gaining their attention as he looked at the man with the straw hat. Are you guys pirates? He asked directly. Yes, we are. The man responded back, grinning as he did so. Sweet. Luffy pumped his fist into the air, much to the man and his companion's amusement. Ace and Sabo are gonna be so jealous. I'm Luffy, the boy said, pointing a thumb at himself before looking expectantly at the redhead. I'm Shanks and we are the Red Hair Pirates, the man said proudly, in which Luffy thought of him to be a funny guy because he was the only one with red hair in his crew. Unbeknownst to them, there was a tiny little spider at the corner of the ceiling not far from them, 
observing everything before it disappeared into a tiny little puff of smoke. At the same time, a young girl was busy reading today's newspapers inside a busy restaurant as she waited for her ramen to be served. Flipping through the pages, her movement paused when she suddenly received a memory from one of her clones back home. And just in time, a young waiter came and placed a big bowl of her favorite food right in front of her. Saying her thanks, the young waiter blushed slightly before making his way back to the kitchen. Instead of enjoying her meal immediately, Nera took the time to observe a wanted poster of a man which was included in a certain page of the newspaper. Shanks, she thought. The name of the pirate captain of the rising red hair pirates. The same man and the same pirate crew whom she saw inside her newly received memory. Well, they didn't seem bad, she thought, before putting away the newspaper before proceeding to enjoy her meal with great appetite. The worst thing that could happen is probably Grandpa coming home while those guys are still there. That was what she thought until she received a new set of memories a few months later. Months later, far away from Dawn Island. Location unknown. In a town somewhere, inside a certain building, in the main office, there were two figures currently doing their own things in said office. One of them was a young lady between the age of 12 to 14, with black hair and bright blue eyes. The most distinguishable feature of the girl was the three thin lines mark on each of her cheek. The girl was currently looking over what looked like an old map. Her eyes scanned through the whole piece of the old paper as if she wished to imprint the whole images drawn on it into her head. Are we finally leaving? The other figure asked. Unlike the girl, this one was not a human being at all, but in fact a big fox with reddish-orange fur. Its size was as big as a tiger. Hearing the other party's question, she pondered the question for a while before nodding her head. Which route do you think we should take, Karama? Karama yawned lazily. Didn't you say before that this place called Calm Belt is a nest for the Sea Kings? You just want to go there for your own personal entertainment. She stared at him blankly. Not denying after being pointed out his obvious desire, he said back to her you don't even have a proper ship to go through this reverse mountain. True. She quickly agreed. It was indeed true that they didn't have a proper ship that could be used to sail to the Grand Line. The only vessel that was in her possession that could be used to sail across the sea was a boat with its own motor that she bought somewhere. The good thing about the boat was that she didn't have to use sails nor did she need to row the boat like she did in her first journey. But even she had to agree that the boat was not a proper ship for her to use to withstand the harsh sea and the unpredictable weathers of the Grand Line. Plus, even with the lack of a proper ship, she still had Karama to give her a lift. Furthermore, what was the point of having a big ship when there was only her and the fox alone? Nero herself didn't have the ability to navigate a ship on her own. Sure, she had her clones to help her out, but if she herself was clueless, then what could the clones even do? Panicking and running around like a headless chicken upon seeing a storm? That would be quite a sight. But just in case if a ship was truly needed if she ever ended up in a troublesome situation in the future, she summoned a clone and told it to go purchase a ship well enough to sail the Grand Line. The clone nodded and immediately set off to find the perfect and suitable ship for the boss. Nera sighed and turned her head to look at the fox, who was resting on the sofa. The current Karama was a lot different from his original form. In reality, with only one long bushy tail and a size that was as big as a tiger, he looked like any other fox. Only slightly bigger than the average foxes. Karama had been using this form since a year ago. His size would increase two times bigger if he let out two tails and he would grow as big as his normal size when all nine tails were revealed. Of course, that would only happen if there was something out there that was worthy enough to see his majestic self. His words, not hers. Nero even let him out in the presence of her brothers before, though he didn't talk around them as they often talked to each other mentally. She introduced Karama as her partner, and the fact that Karama let them call him by his name meant that he accepted them, which made her happy. Also, because she had gotten herself a cool partner, Luffy was encouraged to find himself an animal as a partner to the point where he decided that it would be a good idea to venture into the woods alone to challenge a tiger ten times bigger than himself recklessly. Nero arrived just in time to save him from being eaten alive. Strong he might be than the other kids his age, the now seven years old boy wasn't strong enough to beat the tiger alone. 
she scolded him hard afterward, enough to let him know that she wasn't kidding, especially when it involved the safety of her loved ones. Recalling the memories, she chuckled before a flash of memories being transferred into her head. Beside Luffy and the other people of her hometown, she immediately recognized the group of people that had been staying there for almost a year. Interesting, she said. What is it? Guess who ends up won't be able to swim anymore because he ate a devil fruit by accident. One of your brothers? Karama asked curiously. Luffy. She nodded. So do you want to go back? No hurry, she said while looking outside the window. She had been out in the sea for quite some time now, almost a year to be exact. Sometimes she would send letters to the brats back home. Well, more like one of her clones had to write a letter on that day and transformed into a bird just to give them a damn letter. But yeah. The point was that it had been months since she had returned back to Dawn Island. During her stay here, she had been keeping tabs on her brothers just in case something unexpected were to happen. And boy something did happen which made her unhappy for quite some time now. Why? Well... Beside Luffy making friends with a certain rising pirate crew whose captain was a complete reckless moron who just had to leave a damn devil fruit out in the open, which later caused Luffy to eat it out of habit, today Luffy also stabbed his own face just to prove that he was brave enough. Oh, and apparently Ace and Sabo had been robbing a lot of people from the Grey Terminal quite often these days. Thinking of what they had been up to since she was gone, she ought to give them a good scolding once she was back. The place that she was currently staying in was what she would call her own temporary base of operation. She was currently in Logetown. Fun fact about this place was that this was where the Pirate King was born and executed. But that was not why she chose this place to set up her own little base, albeit temporary. It was more to the fact that Logetown was located at a very strategic location, very close to the Reverse Mountain actually. Many pirates would stop by this town to stock up their supplies before they went to try out their luck and capabilities to go through the reverse mountain. Since it was a good opportunity for her, why wouldn't she take advantage of the situation for her own benefits? Talking with those pirates in hope of digging out more info about the Grand Line was not that hard. Using a disguise as a sexy lady? It worked every time. Sometimes she'd break into their own ship to search for maps, some old documents, wanted posters, more maps, etc. Even though she was tempted enough to steal their treasure, like seriously? Who would be stupid enough to leave a safe full of gold unguarded? But Nera herself was rich. A lot richer than those pirates. Where did she get the money? Don't worry, she robbed nobody. In fact, she gambled in every casino that she found in every place that she visited for the past two years, and always won. Unlike Sonata's rotten luck and gambling, her luck in gambling was legendary. All she did was disguising herself every time she went out to gamble. Sometimes, instead of her, her clones went out to gamble in her place. It was pretty funny to see the disguised clones' photos to be put out on the entrances of those casinos with a big bold letter saying that they were not allowed there. Could it stop her? Nope. Would she stop? Hell nah. She'd leave the place after winning some rounds and each round her bets would go higher and higher. She would leave the place before she could get caught by the owner though. Why? Because even casinos had their own set of rules. You could win a lot of money there, but only within the limit that they allowed. For example, if a certain casino only let you win a million berry as the highest limit, then she'd stop after getting the exact amount of money. More than that? You will have to attend a face-to-face -face conversation with the owner who probably had some connection with some bad pirates, or big names individuals, or even connected by some means, to the world government. Shabby places like the downtowns, casinos, bars, were good places for her to obtain information. Whether they were about the Four Blues or the Grand Line, pirates, or the Marines, she'd get them with no problems. Besides gambling, she also did something else to earn money. She published her own version of the Ika Ika in the East Blue, and recently her books had been sold to the other blues as well. Her books were successful, attracting the attention of both male and female populations. Though the latter were probably more attracted to the male ex male versions of the Ika Ika. Yes, it was porn. But hey, at least Darius' legacy would live on. He would be so proud that he'd be crying in happiness. 
In fact, this building that she was currently staying in was exactly the place where she, more like her clones, produced all those books. All she had to do was to find a publisher that was willing to work for her. When she found one, using Jiraiya's identity, her books were then published and introduced here in Logetown first before slowly gaining popularity and finally being sold everywhere. The amount of money that she gained by selling those books and gambling was no small amount. She was rich enough to buy an island of her own and still have more to spend for the next 100 years. Besides the increase in wealth, she had also increased her skills and abilities. For the past two years, she had been doing a lot of training to get back to her previous strength. That was why she thought that now was a good opportunity for her to finally leave for the Grand Line soon. Nera didn't plan to be a pirate, though she was well aware of the ambition of her three little ducklings. But as long as they abide by morality and humanities that she had tremendously taught them before, she was fine with them being a pirate. Thinking about them, she thought of Sabo next. Nero was glad that she didn't judge the boy for being a son of a noble. She knew of his real identity that he tried so hard to hide from them, yet she didn't expose him. That was not her secret to tell. He would tell them himself eventually. Sabo himself was a good boy. That was why she offered him to live with them. The fact that Ace and Luffy didn't reject her intention meant that they were very close. She was happy to see their bonds grow stronger. It was also good that those three spent more time together since she was seldom at home these days. Her absence would help them to be dependent on each other as they explore more into their own personalities. She wanted them to grow into their own person instead of being what she expected them to be. It would also help them to be less dependent on her, especially her youngest brother who still stuck to her like glue sometimes. You know what, Karama? I think we should leave soon, she said, looking at him with great authority that accepted no rejection. He snorted. I knew it. Many days later. On her way back home, Nero was busy gazing at her reflection on the sparkling ocean surface with a look of boredom. At the moment, she decided that life on the sea was not exactly her cup of tea, especially when she was the only passenger on the boat. Even though she had a companion, said companion was also a bijou that didn't have any social skills and preferred to stay inside the seal. He didn't even want to talk to her, thus making her journey quite boring. Honestly, Nera preferred to stay on land more than sailing. Sailing wasn't actually that bad, but when someone only had one small boat and a partner who refused to communicate, and had been sailing for days across the sea with nothing to do except for looking at the water, the sky, the map, the compass, more water. Nera seriously thought that she might as well go crazy one day. The only event that could be considered interesting was when she was attacked by a couple of sea beasts, but even those were not enough to fulfill her boredom. Karama was around for a few hours to accompany her only to return back to the seal once he was bored, saying that if he were to sleep, he'd better sleep inside the seal instead of sleeping under the sun. Looking away from her reflection to stare at the clouds next, she sighed for the countless time. Sometimes later, her mind drifted back to a couple of kids that she met from a certain village. The last time she had seen Zoro and Kuina was a few months ago. Every time she left Dawn Island, Nero would always go to visit those children first before she left to explore the rest of the East Blue. Thinking of those two, Nero remembered that Zoro had started to practice the art of swordsmanship just like the rest of the male in Shimatsuki village. Since Zoro was her friend, he started to get along well with the Shimatsuki family and from what she could remember, Kushura had accepted the green-haired boy into his dojo. As for Kuina, the girl herself had grown stronger but at the same time she also seemed to develop quite a temper. Unlike the first time when she first saw the younger girl, the queen on now was so obsessed with getting stronger and would throw a fit if she suffered a loss. Sometimes, she would mindlessly mutter a sexist comment every time they saw some men practicing their own swordsmanship at the dojo. Baffled and worried, Nera decided to inform Kushiru of Kuina's weird temper before she left the village but who would have known that that would be her last time seeing the younger girl? Sighing yet again, Nera checked her compass and her map. Well, another couple of hours and we'll be there. True to her words, after a couple of hours, she saw a familiar sight of Dawn Island and increased the speed of her boat. 
Despite having some of her clones to keep a lookout around the island, they didn't keep on monitoring the boys for 24-7, because that would be weird even for her. Plus, with that shanks around the village for months, her clones were forced to keep their distance. She swore that his eyes once drifted to where her clone was hiding that one time, even though her clone had already transformed itself into a harmless-looking cat. Since that day, her clones decided to stay the heck away from the pirate, and just do what they were ordered to do without making any contact with the redhead pirate. And since they were quite diligent in keeping a lookout around the island, Nero found out that some world nobles would be coming to go a kingdom soon. That didn't worry her, since she didn't really care about them in the first place. But what caused her to be on alert was the sight of another pirate ship docked somewhere around the island. The red hair pirates had just left, and another one just came. And unlike the previous pirate crew, this one reeked of trouble. It was a pirate crew that was named after their captain, Blue Jam, thus the Blue Jam Pirates. People here were really bad at naming things. To this day, Nera still wondered what kind of person was her ancestor for him, or her to pick the word monkey among any other words as a surname. Once her boat reached the island, she immediately put it back inside her seal and went into the woods to look for her three troublesome ducklings. When she finally found them, she saw them trying to move, push and carry what looked like a box full of money and gold around the forest sneakily. Amused, she thought that the boys did a pretty good job in robbing those pirates. Such guts. So, what are you guys doing? She decided to speak, causing all three heads to look up and saw a familiar figure looking down at them as she stood steadily on the big tree branch. Pleasant surprise written all over their faces as they smiled widely at her. Nachan, help us. The Blue Jam pirates are trying to catch us. Luffy waved at her and pointed to where the pirates were. Why? Because you brats stole their treasure? They gulped at her words, especially when she was staring at them with a look that said you guys are in trouble. However, they didn't deny her words at all. After all, they did steal from a dangerous pirate crew. Well, technically, it was Ace and Sable who stole from the Blue Jam pirates. Luffy was innocently pulled into the situation when he stumbled upon the older boys counting money with such a wide grin. They claimed that the money was for their pirate fund. So Luffy, instead of being angry at them for doing fun things without him, he just happily helped them to move the treasures to a new hiding spot since Porchimi and his group were on their way to capture Ace and Sabo. Naturally, Nera knew about this. So like a good sister she was, she helped them to hide the goods before telling the boys to return back home as she felt four presences heading their way. With the boys finally out of her sight, Nera didn't move from her spot and just stood there in the middle of the wood as the sounds of footsteps were getting louder and closer. Oh, it's a little girl, said the one whom she believed to be this Porchimi guy. He was a guy with a big figure, even bigger than Garp. The others behind him were busy leering at her with a disgustingly obvious desire in their eyes. She may be twelve, but her body matured quite early. With her tall figure, wearing only a shirt and short pants since it was a very hot day, there was already a noticeable curve on her body. Combined with the uniqueness of her whiskers mark and her bright blue eyes, she was also quite pretty. Therefore, it was natural for people to take a good look at her. Keeping the smile on her face, she held back the urge to scowl at them. Can I help you? They exchanged glances between each other, before glancing at her up and down. They then put on a friendly smile which only made them look like a group of child traffickers. You see, we heard from the people around here that the kids who took our things were heading this way. You don't perhaps know where they are, right? Porchimi asked as the group slowly approached her until she was surrounded with nowhere to escape. Even so, she didn't move. The nearest guy immediately grabbed her arm roughly and sneered at her. You must have known where the heck those damn brats ran away to. Look at these footprints. She looked down and indeed, there were multiple footprints on the ground alongside a trail from when the kids were moving the box. Yeah, you better tell us now. How dare a couple of worthless brats steal from the Blue Jam Pirates? Porchimi looked down at the little girl. Despite being surrounded by pirates, she could still smile without showing any sign of fear or panic on her face, which irked him greatly. Lowering down his body quite a bit, he grabbed her chin harshly, forcing her to look up at him. If you kindly tell us, we will let you go. 
If not, then we will have no choice but to use force. Suddenly, she smirked. You bastards can't even keep your own treasures from a bunch of worthless brats. What makes you think that you can actually do something to me? Huh? Suddenly, before they could blink, Porchimi, who was still grabbing her chin, got kicked right on his stomach so hard he was forced to release his grip on her, as he flew away until his body was slammed right into a huge boulder behind him, leaving a crack. Neru wasted no time nor effort in yanking her arm away from the guy who was holding onto her, making him stumble towards her only to be met with a knee to the face, before she kicked him the same way into the same boulder. His body was resting on top of Porchimis. The other two, upon seeing that both of their crew members were beaten up, tried to escape only for their heads to be grabbed from behind and got slammed face first into the ground. There was a huge crack formed beneath their face after that. It all happened within ten seconds. Staring at the unconscious but alive bodies of the Blue Jam Pirates, she said that's for calling my brothers worthless, you bastards. They are worth more than you will ever be. Then she turned around and left the place, heading to where her home was. That night, she listened to the boys' stories of what exactly they had been up to since she wasn't around for almost a year. Even though Nera had sent them letters every month, they had no way of sending a letter back to her so they didn't have a chance to tell her of what they went through. Not that she needed that, but they didn't have to know that either. Apparently, Ace and Sabo decided to set sail together since they were the same age, much to Luffy's annoyance yet again as he complained to her that they had been neglecting him, much to her amusement. It wasn't like the older boys were ignoring him, but Luffy himself had been getting along too much with the red hair pirates that he always went down to the mountain to hang around with Shanks. Since he had found a new friend, he didn't mind that much about Ace and Sabo doing fun things without him. The older boys were of course suspicious, but when Makino told them that Luffy was being friends with a good pirate crew, they didn't mind either, though of course they were curious. They went to see the pirate crew to introduce themselves as Luffy's older brothers, and that was it. With a good instinct, Ace trusted the man named Shanks to take care of Luffy. Look, that man even gave Luffy his hat even though he lost an arm for saving Luffy from being eaten by a sea king and that horrible bandit who tried to kill his baby brother. But unfortunately, when Ace was going to express his gratitude to the man, he and his crew had already left. And Luffy, other than being a rubber boy because of his devil fruit's nature, he also gained a new scar under his left eye. Now that Luffy got his scar... Nera thought that all of her family shared the same feature of having a mark on their face. Garp with his scar, Dragon with his tattoo, Nera with her whiskers mark, and Luffy with his new scar. On the same night, Nera entertained them by telling them stories of the places that she went to. The next day, Nera left the house early in the morning to do some investigation on her own around Goa Kingdom. From what she had gathered since the news of the world noble's upcoming visit had spread across the kingdom, she noticed that the trash and gray terminal had increased in a great amount lately. It was all because the nobles here wanted their kingdom to be the cleanest kingdom in East Blue, which to her was kind of stupid. Because what they did didn't actually bring any benefit to those who were living in the gray terminal. The nobles threw every trash and things they didn't want into the junkyard. Since the trash had increased, so was the bad stench. Even the people from the central town could detect the bad smell let alone those from the outskirts. Honestly, the nobles were even worse than the trash that they threw away. At first, Nera couldn't figure out what was actually going on in this place since the nobles just went through their daily lives like nothing happened, until she heard the disgusting conversation between the snobbish rich kids saying about how they should just speed up the process of burning the trash, including the people. Nera was disgusted and mad when these children just talked about taking lives as if it was nothing. It seemed like the nobles of this kingdom were planning to get rid of all trashes, by burning the whole great terminal. How could the people here actually have the heart to do such cruel things for no valid reason? Was a world noble's attention worth hundreds of lives? It seems that mankind's desire to destroy has never changed. Karama commented with disdain. Nero couldn't even disagree with his words. Suddenly, as she was walking around the place, she sensed a strong negative emotion coming from somewhere. With a cold gaze, she used full speed as she headed to where the two presences that she was most familiar with. Her brothers were in trouble.
at the Blue Jam Pirate's ship. With Blue Jam making himself comfortable on the sofa, Ace and Luffy were glaring angrily at the man. After Sabo followed the man who claimed to be his father back to the height town, the brothers were beaten up and taken away by these bastards. Blue Jam just wouldn't stop spouting shits about this and that. It made him want to just beat his face with his metal. Only his weapon was nowhere to be seen. To Ace's utmost surprise, Luffy held himself back much better than he thought. You and I have history after what happened to Porchimi, Blue Jam said, confusing the two of them. Your older sister beat up four of my men pretty badly. Up until now, none of them have regained their consciousness yet. The brothers looked at each other, thinking when did their older sister even have the chance to meet Porchimi? While they were curious, they were not that surprised either. The whole island could be said to be her playground. Nothing on this island could escape her watching eyes and listening ears. Those unfortunate guys probably did something that offended her for them to be beaten up that badly. Well, whatever. Blue Jam shrugged. I don't care that much about them, as I only care about the strongest. And dare I say that I am quite interested in your sister. If you two can convince her to join my crew, I might let you two go or all three of you can just join my crew together. Age doesn't matter. Hearing what he said, Ace sneered at him. Ha! Huh. As if. Yeah. Just wait until Nechan is here. She will beat your ass like she did to Porchim. Luffy shouted. And we don't want to join your stupid crew either. Obviously triggered by Luffy's words, Blue Jam stood up and kicked the boy, causing him to bounce like a ball to the other side of the ship. Luffy! Why you? Even though he knew that Luffy would be fine as he wouldn't feel hurt from a blunt attack, Ace was still worried and automatically tried to attack Blue Jam, only for the pirate captain to grab his leg easily. This guy after all, was different from the rest of the punks that he had beaten up in the past. There was a reason why he was given the total bounty of 1430000 berry. It was all due to his fearful and cruel reputation in the East Blue. Someone like Blue Jam wouldn't be an easy opponent that could be defeated easily. I gave you a chance. It's up to you whether to take it or leave it. He warned as he threw Ace harshly to the ground. Because of your sister, I'm actually short on useful people right now. So why don't you help me a little bit as compensation? Instead of a question, it was more like a demand, thinking that the two brats didn't have a choice but to comply. Ace knew that, and he refused to help this bastard who was the reason why Sabo had to go back to the place that he escaped from in the first place. Ace wasn't stupid. This guy was definitely up for something not good. Gritting his teeth, Ace was about to throw some insults to his face when one side of the ship suddenly exploded. Everyone was startled into a moment of panic as they wondered what the heck just happened. Ace and Luffy exchanged glances, knowing what or to be exact, who came and caused the explosion. Ace wasted no time in the midst of the confusion to run back to Luffy's side. While the others were busy freaking out, Blue Jam stayed calm as he narrowed his eyes and waited for the smoke to clear up to see who was this brainless idiot that was brazen enough to blow up half of his ship, though he already had his guess. When the smoke finally cleared up, they saw a silhouette that obviously belonged to a young female. You must be the older sis before Blue Jam could even finish his words, the girl disappeared in a blink of an eye before suddenly appearing right in front of him, delivering a punch aimed to his face. Fortunately for him, he was able to block the incoming punch with his muscular arms. Even so, he was forced to retreat a few meters away from her, creating a space between them. You caught me off guard, he said calmly as the others just gawked at her. Having said that, he could feel the pain all over his arms, not even surprised if his bones were broken or something. And what a speed! Even her strength was no joke. She even managed to make him retreat, causing him to lose face in front of his own crew. That wasn't even half of my strength, Nera said casually. With a quick glance, she saw that both of her brothers were standing together on the other side with Ace standing protectively in front of Luffy. When she saw the obvious bruises and dirt on them, she narrowed her eyes and clicked her tongue. I assume that you were the one who beat up my brothers? Blue Jam wasn't phased by her glare. And what if I did? Nera said nothing. Instead she just charged forward with an even greater speed than before, causing the woods underneath her feet to be shattered into pieces. 
Shit! Blue Jam cursed as he readied himself to move out of the way but alas it was useless, for he had already felt the side of his body to be kicked ruthlessly with such a strong impact that it made him go through the wall of his ship and landed himself a hundred meters away from where he originally was. By now, the poor ship would not be able to set sail anymore. Even its captain was now laying pathetically on the ground, unable to bring himself to stand up since his bones had already been broken because of a brat decades younger than himself. The fact that he was still breathing and still hadn't lost his consciousness, or worse dead was all because of his strong will to survive. As he laid there, he could hear the loud voices of his crew screaming out in pain, but due to the blood and dirt all over his face, he couldn't see anything clearly. Next thing he knew, he was tied up alongside the rest of his crew members who were all unconscious with bruises and wounds all over their bodies. I gotta say. Nera paused watching him with a lazy temperament in the air. You sure are strong. To be able to keep your consciousness until now. Most would end up like them already. He growled at her. There was a burning resentment in his eyes, wishing that he could just kill this damn girl with his own bare hands. He glared at her back when she turned around and walked to her brother's side. Bitch. He couldn't believe that he could lose to a mere girl. Sure he was still conscious but he was still on the verge of dying. Right now his 1430000 berry bounty and his reputation sounded like a total joke even to him. The last thing that he saw before he passed out was the sight of one of those two shitty brats that stole from him, smirking at him with a mocking gaze in his eyes. Nachan, I knew you would come! Luffy exclaimed cheerfully as he wrapped his arms around her waist. Nera simply smiled and ruffled his already messy hair before wiping off the dirt on his face. She then did the same to Ace. And even though the older boy grumbled at her, he didn't push her away either. I'm glad that you're both okay. She said. But Sabo is not okay. Luffy claimed, making her confused and wondered the whereabouts of the other brat. The two brothers then proceeded to tell her everything that happened while she was gone. From Sabo confessing to them about his true identity and dreams before he was apprehended by his father with the help of the Blue Jam Pirates, before he went back to the high town willingly in exchange for their safety. Luffy also mentioned about how the three of them exchanged cups of sake in order to become sworn brothers and a dream to set sail together. Obviously Nero wasn't happy with them drinking sake at such an early age, so she slapped their heads upside down. Oh it hurts. Luffy complained. Nachan, you're becoming more like Grandpa. Ace too, was glaring at her. A tick appeared on her forehead. Shut up. Sable will get one from me too. How dare the three of you drink alcohol when you guys are still kids? They blinked when she mentioned Sable, before giving her an expectant grin of their own. Are we going to get him back? Not we, she said sternly. Then she noticed a bunch of suspicious-looking boxes that she already knew what was inside them, before looking at the confused Luffy and Ace. Sometimes later, when she was on her way to see Sabo, she noticed a glowing red mixed with orange hue which indicated that the fire had already started. Exactly like what she had expected. The nobles had other people beside the Blue Jam pirates to do their dirty deeds. It seemed like they were really determined to get rid of everything that was considered trash in their eyes. Fortunately, she had already arranged her clones, her brothers and the Dayton family to warn the people living in the Grey Terminal to leave the place before the fire started. Once they were done with their jobs, Nero sternly told them to return back to the house and wait for her to return with Sabo. Much to her relief, Ace and Luffy listened to her words obediently. By now, they were probably done, and now on their way back to Dayton's house. As she moved swiftly across the roof, she halted her movements upon seeing the small figure of the boy that she was looking for in the distance. But he wasn't alone as he was currently gripping the cloak of someone who she presumed to be a man. The anxious-looking Sabo was crying as he was telling something to the man with desperation written all over his face. Narrowing her eyes before widening them in surprise upon recognizing the person's presence, she once again resumed her movement and landed right behind the unknown man. Without any hesitation, she greeted him. Father. Dragon turned his head slightly to look at her, before he nodded his head. Nerua! 
Sabo immediately launched himself towards her before falling straight into her embrace. With tears and snots on his face, he tried to tell her everything that he knew. Everyone is fine, Sabo. She comforted him. Ace and Luffy are fine. We have already warned everyone else about the fire. Still crying, he asked Ah, really? She smiled at him as she rubbed his head like she often did to the other two. Of course. Have I ever lied to you before? Sniffling, he shook his head. See? Trust me, okay? Everything is fine. You don't have to worry anymore. Hmm. He then nodded his head and buried his face into her stomach as he released a shaky breath. Nera then looked at Dragon who had been silent the entire time and said as I said before, we have already warned the people of the fire, but there are still those who are still unable to escape. I hope you can help them. That is to be expected. Dragon nodded. Staring at her father for one last time, Nera took Sabo and placed him on her back. Then, we'll be leaving first. And just like that, she disappeared like the wind, leaving Dragon all alone on the empty street. Looking at the couple of leaves that appeared after his daughter was gone, his eyes shone with pride. She has grown so much, he said to himself, before turning around to get his job done. That night, there were those who were able to sleep soundly in their beds, and there were also those who couldn't even close their eyes. The next day. The big fire accident that happened in Grey Terminal aroused many suspicions and questions among those who were alive to witness the big fire last night. The people were not stupid. It wasn't that hard for them to figure out and connect the dots. Many of them made the same conclusion that the fire must be linked to those of the higher births. After all, the world nobles would be visiting the kingdom soon, so the nobles here would most definitely be anxious about that. They couldn't afford to have a slight mishap at all. But even if everyone knew the truth, what could they do? Who were they and who were them? And so, those who were involved in the fire accident last night could only swallow their grievances and try to find a new place for them to stay and move on with their life. The lack of action taken about the whole accident was a big proof that it would never be brought up in the future again. Because of that, different actions were taken and shown. Those who were saved by Dragon decided to join the Revolutionary Army to fight for their freedom. The nobles were living their lives like usual, no doubt feeling great for their successful attempt to get rid of the trash. But unlike other nobles who were celebrating and anticipating the arrival of their respective guests, Outlook 3 and the rest of his family didn't feel any joyful mood at all. Inside the huge mansion, a man and his wife were sitting side by side with their heads lowered, eyes gazing blankly at the expensive carpet covering the marble floor. Their shoulders trembled, and their adopted son, Steli was still hiccuping at the corner of the room with a terrified and traumatized look on his face. Maybe because she couldn't handle the silence that was more deafening than an explosion, Didit looked at her husband and whispered quietly as if she was afraid that someone other than her husband would hear her. W.H. What should we do now, darling? He gulped. Steli, who was a mess, had long been forgotten by the pair. They couldn't even care less about their own flesh and blood, let alone an adopted one especially after what just happened to them. We do as we are expected to do, he said quietly, eyes anxiously looking around his own house, afraid of the watchful eyes of the demon. His eyes then fixed on the weirdly shaped knife that was thrown on the wall right above the head of their adopted son, leaving only a huge crack. Yes, for the demon would always watch over them. When Nera returned back to the house, she saw the boys arguing with each other or it was more like Luffy yelling at Sable who had his eyes fixed on the ground. Okay, what the heck is going on here? She asked with an obvious displeasure on her face. The three flinched at the tone that she used and knew that she was angry, which was the truth. She really didn't have the mood to deal with their nonsense when she was just back after meeting a certain bastard. Sable wants to set sail alone, Luffy claimed. Nera looked at Sable, then Ace before looking at Luffy. She then took a deep breath and said so? Be but. Weren't you supposed to say no? Her unexpected reaction didn't only surprise the children, but also Dayton and the rest who were watching them quietly from the sideline. Nero was always known to be quite stern and protective over the boys, so they were somewhat surprised that she didn't seem to care about one of them planning to leave at such a young age. 
Luffy wondered why his sister didn't seem to disagree with Sabo's weird idea. They were supposed to set sail together. They promised. And then suddenly Sabo just said that he wanted to leave because he didn't want to live here anymore. What did he mean by that? Did Sabo choose to leave because of his parents? But even if he wanted to leave, at least they should go together. Luffy didn't understand why Sabo insisted on going alone. He thought that after Nechan brought Sabo home last night, everything would be fine. But certainly it wasn't. Nera held back a sigh and said Sabo has his own reasons. He can leave if he wants to go. Then let me and Ace follow him too. No, she said sternly. But why? Luffy didn't want to give up. I said no, and it's final. Ace won't go too. This time, she let out her intimidating aura, telling them that she was very serious. You two are not allowed to step foot outside of this island without my permission. Luffy was obviously affected by Nera's sudden aura, causing him to tremble, but he composed himself and refused to give up on this topic. Then how come you can do the same? How come Sabo can go but me and Ace can't? Nachan, you're so unfair. Luffy. Ace glared at Luffy for raising his voice. Don't be so rude. But Ace. Luffy felt wronged and started to tear up. Enough. Nero interrupted before a fight could start between them. She looked at Luffy with a frown and said it looks like I might have babied you too much after all. Sable will leave the island if he wants to, and the two of you will stay here until you're old enough to set sail. This is my final decision. Sabo has his own reasons and his own battle to fight. And for that, he has to do this alone, just like he wants. Battle? Then we can help too. You're too weak to help him, she said bluntly, and the others winced at her bluntness. Why do you think Sabo chose to follow his father back without struggling at the end? It was because he wanted to save the two of you. The two of you couldn't even beat Blue Jam but got beaten up instead, and because of that, Sabo chose to sacrifice his freedom once again just to return back to the place that he escaped from in the first place because there was nothing else that could be done. Her blunt remarks caused Luffy and Ace to flinch after being reminded of what happened yesterday. Nera continued, You know what? We are fortunate enough to live freely until now, and that's all thanks to Grandpa, Dayton and everyone else for keeping us safe here because nobody knows about our identities yet. I don't expect Luffy to understand this yet but I expect you to understand, Ace. Just like how the world will become our enemy once our identities are revealed, Sabo's enemies are the nobles themselves. His inner demon is his status as a noble. The demon that he has to fight in order to get his freedom. The nobility is his enemy. You both can be all high and mighty for beating up some punks and some wild animals in the forest, but those rich bastards are different. Be but. If I didn't return this time, do you really think that Sabo would be here right now? Do you think that those people would be able to escape from the fire alive? No, because they would all be dead. Because the nobles would still be able to lit up the whole place on fire with Bluejam's aid because you couldn't beat him. Not wanting to lose, Luffy puffed his cheeks and said stubbornly, but you're here now. You came and helped everyone. But what if I didn't? She asked, staring hard at Luffy before looking at Ace, Sabo and the others. Sabo didn't want the situation to get any worse so he tried to speak up but was shot down with one look by the older girl's menacing glare. I know that you're upset and still can't understand our situation clearly, Luffy, Nerys said softly, but you still need to understand and accept the fact that life will not always go the way you want it to. Living here will only remind Sabo that he is in fact not as free as he wishes yet. He wants to fight for his freedom not wanting to live by the rules set by those that he hates the most. And he just doesn't want to involve anyone else in his struggle, especially you two. When her youngest brother lowered his head, Nero went forward and placed a hand on top of his head in a comforting manner. So you need to respect his decision. You want to follow him? Then be strong enough so that you won't have to worry about being beaten by an enemy, strong enough so that we don't have to worry about you. So that you know so that we all can protect each other without having to worry of what we will have to face in the future. Because in the end, somewhere in the future, we will all share the same kind of enemy. It will be us against the world. Everyone's eyes went wide at what she said. 
They all knew that the children were special because of their identities. Neru and Luffy as the children of the revolutionary dragon who tried to overthrow the world, and Ace as the son of the pirate king that the world wanted to erase from existence. The world government would never let these children live once they were aware of the children's existence. Sabo himself was the son of a noble, and he had witnessed the cruelty of the nobles himself, thus choosing them to be his enemies as he considered them to be the obstacle of his freedom. Together, all four of them really did share the same enemy. Garp was a marine with a high status, and that old guy would not be able to protect his grandchildren forever. And everyone knew that Nera would be leaving this place any time soon just like how she had planned, thus she would also not be able to protect her brothers forever. Ace understood that. Since he grew up under her care, Ace shared the same thinking and temperament as his older sister, thus he more or less understood her reasoning. Do you understand? Nera asked, but nobody responded. Ace looked at Sabo and asked, Are you sure? Sabo nodded. We will certainly meet each other again. So Ace, Luffy, no matter where I would end up at, always know that we will always be brothers. Even though we will not be sailing under the same flag, it will never change our brotherhood. Ace nodded and grinned at him, while Luffy sniffled as he nodded too. Then when are you leaving? Sable glanced at Nero who nodded at him, before looking at the other two again and said today. But that's too soon, Luffy exclaimed. Even the others were surprised. I'll be following this group of people. The leader was the one who put out the fire and saved everyone. I'll be joining them with the rest of the people from the Great Terminal. Just like me. Those people are also fighting against the nobles. They fight for freedom. Who are those people? Ace asked curiously. The Revolutionary Army. Nero answered. Yhhh? The others except Sable looked at her in shock, especially Luffy. Nachan, you mean? Dead? Nero just smiled. In the end Luffy didn't meet dragons since the man himself was quite good at hiding himself from them. Nera took it as his decision not wanting to see them. Nera and Luffy didn't take it to heart though, since they were already used to it. Later that evening, Sabo finally left and the rest only watched as the huge ship that carried the blonde boy and the other people to somewhere else. Before he left, they shared a simple farewell with smiles and cheers in a good mood, because it wasn't like they were not going to see each other again. Sabo's departure would be followed by Nera's next. And then Ace and Luffy had to wait until they reached the appropriate age for them to set sail as what they had promised her before. The trio watched silently as the ship was getting farther and smaller into the distance before slowly disappearing from their view. Nachan. Ace. From now on, I will grow even stronger. Luffy suddenly declared. I will be strong enough that I won't ever have to suffer any defeat from anyone ever again. One day, I'll be strong enough to beat you too. Pfft, say that again after you can actually throw a decent punch. Ace taunted him. I'm telling you the truth. One day, my punch will be strong enough it will even destroy a mountain. Even Grandpa will be beaten by me. Grandpa is a monster, Nera stated. Plus, if you truly want to beat me then you have to wait for at least him twenty years? Ace laughed at her words while Luffy looked like he was about to throw another fit. Seeing Luffy's pouting face, the older two laughed even harder. I'm serious. I will set sail on my own, find the One Piece and become the Pirate King. That's it, if you can beat me to it first. Ace said with a smug look. Until this day, Luffy had never won a single fight against his older siblings, especially after he had gotten his devil fruit. So you only want... One piece right? Nera asked him with a pointed look. He nodded. That was what he said. Then I shall have the whole thing after you get only one piece of it. She grinned at him. Catching on to what she was trying to do, Ace decided to play along. Yeah. After you take one piece, Nero and I can have the whole thing after that. Eh? There's actually a treasure called whole thing? How come I didn't know anything about that? Seeing the innocent look on his face, Nehru and Ace laughed even harder. Hey! Stop laughing! The next day, Nehru and the one-tailed Karama were getting ready as Nehru checked the condition of her boat. It was quite early in the morning so the rest of the villagers were not awake yet, 
giving the opportunity for her family including the bandits to come down the mountain to send her off. After saying their farewell, she finally started her real journey to the Grand Line. Maybe because this journey was different than the previous ones, but Nero was a lot more excited than usual. Once they were far enough, Karama proceeded to grow back into his original form. He landed on top of the water surface, and she wasted no time in sealing away her boat before jumping onto his back. Then he sprinted off to his desired location. The Calm Belt The route that they, Karama, chose as their starting point. Looking at the horizon, Nero wondered what things would she face there? What kind of journey would she go through? What kind of people would she meet? She would only know once she was there. Chapter 8 Marine Ford Archive Present time, ten years after Nera departed from the East Blue. Location, a bar in a town somewhere. Recently, the world had been slapped with the newest issue that occurred not too long ago, raising countless debates and different opinions from everyone regardless of their races, ages, gender, and sides that they chose. A conversation could be heard as several people in the bar were talking to each other about the latest news that had been spread all over the world. I can't believe that they were actually able to catch one of Whitebird's commanders. Whitebird will definitely not going to stay quiet about this. Announcing the execution of one of his commanders publicly, that was one bold move. But that old guy is still a Yonko, do you think the Marines will win? So? Like you said, he's an old guy now. He's probably not as strong as he was in his prime. But all of the Whitebird pirates are strong too. I heard that Marco is only second to Whitebeard. Well, one thing for sure, this is gonna be one hell of a fight. At the corner of the bar, a man could be seen sitting alone as he read a recent newspaper while listening to other people's conversation. His eyes gleamed with interest when even another Yanko was mentioned and brought into their debate. Not long after that, feeling that he had enough, he paid for his drink and left the bar before making his way to somewhere quiet. Making sure that there wasn't anyone or anything else that could eavesdrop on him, he pulled out a small den-den mushy and dialed a familiar number that he had already memorized by heart, waiting. Kachak. What is it? The man immediately grinned upon hearing the familiar voice, no doubt belonged to a woman. What? Not even a hello? He asked in a joking manner, but the woman didn't respond. Worried that he might annoy her, he quickly added all right all right. I'm just going straight to the point and say that, knowing you, you must have heard about this already. Poor Gas the Ace's public execution. Silence. The whole world knows that. She replied back with no hurry. Yeah, but the whole world is not you. He chuckled. So, what are you going to do about this? For now, we shall wait and see. She sighed. Since you're already out there, I want you to go and find that guy. You mean? Him? He asked, though he already knew the answer. It was to be expected that she wanted to find that guy after the news. Exactly. I've already told him to wait for my news. She said. Because unlike some people I know, he's the most unlikely to do something reckless without thinking things through. Well, in a sense, he's a lot like you. He stated. By the way, have you decided? Yes. She said. We'll proceed with our next stage. He grinned at her words. It's about time. The world shall finally know about us. When the upcoming execution of poor Gastiace was made public, it stirred up a lot of commotion among the people. For the Marines, they took the matter of poor Gastiace very seriously. Even though the mere thought of fighting against the strongest pirate crew of the sea frightened most of them since they were the ones who served the absolute justice and protected the people from evilness. They were ready to take the risk despite knowing that they could very much lose their lives on the line. The news of poor Gastiace being captured would definitely enrage a certain Yanko, let alone when the Marines announced his public execution to the world. A lot of Marines would be joining the anticipated battle against the Whitebird Pirates, because everyone knew that Edward Newgate was not someone who would just sit back and do nothing when his son was about to be executed. This further led to many crimes being committed by the outlaws who took advantage of the current situation. Since most of the Marines were being stationed at one place at the same time, they weren't able to fully prevent the situation from happening. The one who suffered in the end, 
of course, would be the innocent and helpless citizens. Because of their unfortunate circumstances, those citizens were hoping more than anyone else that the Marines would win the battle, to end the piracy that was supposed to end 22 years ago. The increased number of crimes was not the only thing that made the Marines helpless, but it was also noted that the ship belonged to the Whitebird Pirates, the Moby Dick, had been spotted to finally make a move along with the other pirate ships that were believed belonged to those affiliated with the Yonko. But suddenly, all of them disappeared from the radar. Because of that unexpected piece of news, the Marines were distraught over the fact that they wouldn't be able to detect when, where and how those pirates would appear and attack. They even started to become even more paranoid and thought that Whitebird would attack the impelled down just to save poor gas. Later, they would receive a report saying that the underwater prison with its maximum security would get snuck in by a boy who would be mostly responsible for the massive prison breakout of the whole history. At the same time, in Impel Down, an underwater prison where all captured criminals were currently being held, especially the most dangerous criminals and pirates. The prison itself was located right underneath the comm belt. At the lowest level of the prison which was actually for the most dangerous criminals one of them being the second commander of the Whitebeard Pirates. Poor Gas the Ace. The man was chained to the wall with Kairosiki, and despite the bruises and wounds from all over his body, he appeared to be calm enough for someone who was about to be executed. His eyes were still very much alive with the undying flame of determination in them. There was a slight smile on his very much matured face as he stared calmly at the older man who was sitting in front of him. Or rather, sitting right outside of the cell that he was currently in. Monkey D. Garp, his adoptive grandfather. If Ace was another person, he would certainly hold a grudge against this man for not doing anything when one of his grandchildren was captured and was about to be executed in front of everyone, despite being the one who used to keep him safe and protected from his natural enemies years ago. But Ace was not another person. They both knew that this would happen one way or another and he knew that Garp himself would not be able to do anything due to his position as a vice-admiral. Ace wasn't mad. Instead, he just greeted the old man just like how he always did. As if the one who was about to go through a public execution was not him. Like that man. How ironic. Look at you. Garp snorted at the pathetic sight of his grandson. In your situation, you still have the cheek to smile? Why not? Did you expect me to cry or something? Ace talked back. TCH, things wouldn't have become like this if you brats had become marines like I wanted you to. But instead, you brats became terrible criminals. Then he punched the floor to show his dissatisfaction, leaving a small crack. Then, acting like nothing happened, Garp proceeded to complain more and more of their terrible choice of careers before he changed the topic to Luffy. Ace was amused though. He didn't know whether the old man was disappointed or proud of what his youngest grandkid had done. While knowing him, he was probably proud of Luffy making ruckus here and there, causing troubles for the world government. Everyone knew that, if Garp didn't choose to become a marine, he would damn well become a pirate instead. Perhaps, if he did become one, he would probably become a Yanko or the pirate king himself. He even acted like a pirate on a daily basis. You know more than anyone else that it was highly impossible for any of us to become Marines. They stated. Especially when the three of us carry the blood of the global criminals. Since when did you even care about whose blood is running through your veins? We don't, but they do. The chained man chuckled, ignoring the pain in his chest from all of the beatings that he had gotten earlier. I never care about the blood that came from the man that I've never had memory of, nor do I have any debts to him. Because for me, Whitebeard is the only father that I have. Garp said nothing. He wanted to, but in the end he refrained himself from doing so. He looked at the brat that he was supposed to take care of, and sighed. Old man, you better mark my words. Ace gave Garp a grin. With them by side, victory won't belong to the Marines. As a Marine, he should have been angry over the rascal's words, but instead he just laughed it off. Not because he thought that the brat was making a joke, but because Garp knew that Ace was right. They both knew. Other than the Whitebird pirates, Ace also had them by his side. Nobody knew them better than him, their old grandfather. Even though two of them were not related to him by blood, 
he cared about them nonetheless. Thinking of his brats, a childish voice from a distant memory rang inside his head at that moment. You know, Grandpa? One day, you won't be able to protect us anymore. But that's okay. I'll do what you can't do. That's a promise. If what he thought would actually happen, then he hoped that Sengoku would not be too angry with him. The more he thought about it, the louder he laughed. While the duo were talking, completely ignoring their surroundings, they were also unaware of a certain someone who was currently on his way to save his big brother. Which later turned out to be a futile attempt. Later. Ace was devastated. After his conversation with Garp, he still managed to keep his calm just like when he found out that he was about to get his head cut off in front of everyone. When it was finally his time to be transferred to Marie Ford, his heart dropped when he overheard the sudden report saying that his little brother was being subdued by a sleeping gas in level 6. That was where he was previously held. Dozens of scenarios that he imagined, but none of them involved Luffy recklessly barging into the impelled down of all places just to save him. That moron! It had to be said that Luffy's unknown situation in Impel Down really made him feel uneasy and restless throughout his whole journey to Marie Ford. All he could do was wonder whether his little brother was still alive, or if he was all alone there, which later led him to wonder of Luffy's crew. He hoped that the Straw Hat members would be able to get their captain out of that place, even though Ace himself knew that it would be impossible. With a heavy heart, all he could think about was Luffy's safety until he reached Marie Ford. Once he was brought to the execution platform, Ace's face was as dark as a charcoal. He wasn't afraid of dying, but he still wanted to live. However, he couldn't help but to blame himself when he saw how his old man was forced to jump into the enemy's net because of him. Ace didn't think that highly of himself that everyone would come just to save his ass, but deep down in his heart, he knew that they would come anyway. During that time, Sengoku took the chance to reveal his blood father's identity and the story behind his birth to the whole world. And Ace also didn't hesitate to claim Whitebeard as his only father in this lifetime. Ace loved the Yonko so much that he actually wanted the old man to become the next pirate king, and later denied Sengoku's accusation that Whitebeard was only protecting him just to groom him into the next pirate king. Only Whitebeard deserved to hold that title. After his identity was revealed, the whole world began to curse and wish for his death immediately but Ace felt that their words didn't hurt him as much as he thought it would be. Because the more they wanted him to die, the more he wanted to live. After some time passed, the ships belonging to those affiliated with Whitebeard appeared, but the ships belonging to the Whitebeard pirates were nowhere to be seen. The tension rose among the marines as the time for war was getting closer. Suddenly, the Moby Dick and the other ships appeared in the middle of the bay sailing underwater by coating their ships. All seriousness aside, Ace was impressed with their entrance, as expected of the Whitebeard pirates. Then he watched as the battle began and his crewmates charged forwards with their loud battle cries as they shouted for his name. He grieved for Orza's supposed death. Even though he had already expected them to come for him, he was also worried that they would experience huge losses because of him. Feeling a huge sense of guilt, Ace was upset. Upset at himself for he was the reason why they had to get involved in this bloody war in the first place. It was because he was too weak against that damn traitor. But honestly Ace didn't regret his actions even a little bit. If it wasn't him, then afraid that the one who would be in his place was his little brother instead. He couldn't bear to let it happen. After that, Garp decided to sit next to him as a family member instead of one of those people that were responsible for his current predicament. Ace was glad that the old man didn't join the battle at least. Even he himself wasn't sure if his crew could handle the man who was considered to be on the same level as the pirate king. Not that he doubted the crew's strength and power. With no words exchanged, they silently watched the chaotic sight beneath them with a solemn face, for no matter which side they belonged to, death was inevitable. Then, much to their surprises and a bit of amusement, a sudden appearance of a marine battleship falling straight down from the sky stopped all of them, marines and pirates alike, from battling to focus on the unexpected event. Ace didn't know whether to laugh or cry or just be mad because Luffy managed to escape from Impel Down only for him to make his way here with some familiar and interesting people. 
The Mara Mara no Mi user would be lying if he said that Luffy's determination to save him didn't touch his heart at all. After that, the world was stupefied once again by another discovery about how Luffy was the son of Dragon who was also the son of Vice Admiral Garp. At that very moment, both Garp and Ace wanted to see their expression once they found out that Dragon still had another child. For now, until he was released from this stupid cuff, Ace could only watch as his little brother determinately fought his way through the marines with the help of the Whitebeard pirates and those weird people, with one of them he recognized as one of the revolutionaries. The sound of battle cries from the marines and pirates, the clashing sound of swords against each other, the deafening sound of explosion along with the smell of gunpowder, and the rain of bullets that took the lives of many others. The whole marine fort could be said to be a complete battlefield. Unlike its previous proud image as the pillar of justice, the whole place had now become a complete wreck. Luffy wondered how did a journey to do some coding to his ship ended up with him in this situation. He laid there pathetically after being shot by the light man's beam, completely drained of energy and helpless as he looked at his big brother who was still kneeling above the platform. Guts alone are not enough. If you don't have the strength, there are things that you cannot save no matter how hard you try, Kizara said. The admiral's words lingered in his head as he was kicked away by someone, only to be caught by old man Whitebeard. He didn't hear what the others were saying. The only things that kept on ringing in his ears were the words spoken by the admiral. It reminded him of when he was scolded once for the same reason when he was seven. The things that his older sister said were right. Without enough strength, he would never be able to win against the enemies. Like what happened now. At this time, as his body was passed over by old man Whitebeard to another person, he was suddenly struck with a memory. Then be strong enough so that you won't have to worry about being beaten by an enemy. Strong enough so that we don't have to worry about you. So that you know. So that we all can protect each other without having to worry of what we will have to face in the future. Because in the end, somewhere in the future, we will all share the same kind of enemy. It will be us against the world. Her words came true. Because of their lineages, the world had truly become their enemy. Just like what happened to Robin who was taken away by the world government just because she knew how to read some rocks. Thankfully, he and the crew managed to get her back. But once again, he had to face the same situation, but this time it was his older brother. World Government Luffy knew exactly who was their enemy. The memory and his thoughts alone were enough to wake him up and made him even more determined to fight. At the same time, not far from Marineford. The blue sky was peaceful with some clouds roaming around freely, despite a certain war going on at the moment. Suddenly, something fast just passed through the clouds, causing them to disperse into smaller clouds or just completely disappeared from view. That something was none other than a bird. It wasn't just a single bird, but at least five of them and they were big, at least big enough to let five people ride on their backs. These birds were flying in a V position, and each one of them had at least one person on them. Only the one in the middle, which was also the one to lead the other birds, carried two people. One of the two people was holding on to a small snail while looking straight ahead to where a certain battle was currently taking place. The person was having a conversation through the Den Den Mushi. How's the situation over there? There's good news and bad news, Diso. A high-pitched girly voice responded. Which one leader San wants to hear first? Good. The second person said before the first one could give a reply. They both could clearly hear the sound of battle cries. Weapons clashing and explosions in the background. Well, Straw Hat Luffy managed to free fire Fist Ace. The one with the high pitched voice said before saying, And bad news is, I can see that things are not going well over here. Whitebeard himself doesn't look good. He just told his crew to leave, Disa. Leader San, all of you need to get here quick. I got it. The one dubbed as Leader San nodded. Be careful and wait for us. We'll be there in just a moment. Aye, Leader San. Kachak. The call ended. Leader San took a deep breath before she opened her mouth and loudly said, Prepare yourself. Once we get there, do not engage in any battle without my instruction. The others who had remained quiet a while ago heard their leader's voice loud and clear, despite the sharp, loud sound of the passing wind due to the speed that these birds used. Okie dokie. 
Yes. The others who didn't respond just nodded their heads. All of them were wearing a mask that covered their faces. That mask alone was just a simple mask without any design except for the two holes for their eyes to see. Adding on the white cloak with a spiral symbol on the back of the cloak that they were wearing, their appearances were completely hidden except for their eyes and hair. Even the leader wore a mask. But unlike the others, hers resembled that of a fox. She was also wearing a white coat with the same spiral symbol on its back, and there was a stripe of the color orange at the end of her coat. She then looked at her silent partner and asked what do you think? Her companion looked at her blue eyes and she wondered silently to herself that given another few years, this guy would surely be taller than her. He used to look up at her, but now they were actually on the same eye level. He was also wearing the same cloak as the others but without the spiral symbol, and he didn't wear a mask either. In his hand was a long staff that he deemed as his main weapon. Great enough to give them a good show. He chuckled. She laughed. Why, of course. It would bring a great shame to our reputation if I failed to do it with a loud bang to bail. Chapter 9, Marie Ford Arc 2 Back to the battlefield, the current Marie Ford could hardly be recognized for its former glory. Destroyed buildings, destroyed ships, half-dying men, ice and lava here and there. Not to mention the marines, pirates, revolutionaries and even former prisoners here. All of them were fighting for what they believed in, or simply following their selfish desires. They lost comrades, but the battle had to go on. Some fought for goodness and justice, some chose their greediness, or simply just fought for their loved ones. No matter the reason, all of them eventually led to a war. The marines were getting restless when they all witnessed how Straw Hat Luffy managed to free fire fist ace from his shackles. The most irritated one was probably the fleet admiral himself since the criminals escaped right under his nose. It was disgraceful and unacceptable for a man of his position. With great teamwork, the two brothers managed to beat up the marines that tried to catch them with ease. As the brothers fought together side by side, the rest were taken aback when one of the pirate ships suddenly moved forward, led by a suicidal squadro who thought that committing a suicidal mission was the right way for him to redeem himself for betraying his father. It was clear to see that the man refused to stop the ship from moving forward as he ignored the other's pleadings and warnings. But thankfully, before the ship could reach the city, Whitebeard left everyone speechless with a power display by stopping the ship itself with one bare hand. Ignoring the ugly-looking wound that had been inflicted by Squadro's sword, Whitebeard acted like how a parent would scold his misbehaved child, scolding the man while saying that his mere scratch was not enough to kill him. Then the Whitebeard pirates and their allies were taken aback by what the Yonko said next. We came here to accomplish something, and we succeeded. So there is nothing that is keeping us here anymore. Somehow, the others felt uneasiness crept into their heart, but they still focused to hear what the old man was trying to say. Even the marines like Garp, Sengoku and the three admirals were listening carefully to what the old captain had to say. I'll give you an order. That will be my last as your captain. So listen carefully, Whitebird pirates. He said firmly, raising a bunch of denials, rejections and objections from each one of his children. Ignoring their words, he inhaled and loudly declared as he released a strong aura that only captains and leaders possessed. This is where our paths separate, sons. Without me, all of you must survive and return back safely to the new world. His words this time caused more commotions among them. One of them even cried out devastatingly that Whitebeard intended to sacrifice himself for their sake. Not denying that, Whitebeard only stated that he himself was nothing more than a relic of old history. I don't have any place in any ship that sails towards the new era, he said as he delivered an enormous quake into the city of Marineford, causing the others to gawk at him in surprise. Watching the place crumbling due to his sudden attack, Edward Newgate thought back to his past. He always wanted a family of his own instead of a treasure, and the others laughed at him for his foolish dream. But now, look at him. He had a wonderful family, his greatest treasure. That alone was enough for him to continue with his resolve, staring intensely at what still remained in front of him. The Pathetic-Looking Marine HQ My journey has been long enough as it is. Let's end this, Marine HQ. While the Marines were panicking with the state of their proud HQ, 
the Whitebeard pirates tearfully tried to convince their captain to go back with them, causing Whitebeard to feel extreme heartache that was unrelated to his sickness. In the end, they reluctantly followed his order and began to leave with tears on their faces, forcing and grabbing their other comrades who were still persisted in getting their captain to come back with them to the new world. The marines tried to stop them from leaving, only for them to be intercepted by Whitebeard, intentionally giving the pirates enough time to escape. He really is planning to sink the whole place with his own life as a sacrifice. Sengoku gritted his teeth and clenched his fists in anger. At this rate, the entire Marie Ford would cease to exist if he let the pirate continue going on a rampage. Checking on Garp, he heard the vice admiral muttering under his breath about how the Yonko intended to end the current era of piracy with his life. On the other side, the Den Den Mushi responsible for recording and broadcasting the battle to the people and reporters watching from Sabadi Archipelago, finally recovered to show them the current state of the battle in Marineford. Also, at the same time, Emporio Ivankov tried to make Luffy to move. The boy was staring at the back of his older brother who still hadn't moved ever since old man Whitebeard told them to leave. Luffy understood how he felt, but he would not let Ace to do something stupid now. Ace. Let's go now, or else the old man's resolution would be wasted. Ace's face darkened. I know. In the midst of the case, Ace suddenly dropped down to his knees and knocked his forehead on the ground as he bowed to Whitebeard. He wanted to tell the old man of how grateful he was for the captain to accept him, and even took him in as a son. But before he could even express his appreciation, Whitebeard beat him to it by asking him something that caused him to finally let his tears fall. Am I a good father? Was what the Yonko asked. Of course. Ace answered tearfully, which made Whitebeard laugh heartily. He was obviously pleased and happy with the answer. It was enough for him, as he didn't have any regrets left. Finally, all of them were all ready to leave the place via warship. A kind of who had been watching silently as these pirates acted so foolish for thinking that they could escape from this place that easily finally made his move as he sent a huge fist of magma to the runaway pirates. Running away the moment you grabbed Ace. What a bunch of cowards. Both the captain and his crew members are all total cowards. But it can't be helped. Whitebeard after all is just a failure from the previous era. The admiral mocked them, causing Ace to stop on his tracks and turned around to glare hatefully at him. Take back what you just said. Ace snapped with a dark look. He couldn't bear to hear someone insult his father figure like that. The others shouted at him, telling him to not get provoked by Akainu's bullshits, even though they too wanted to just go over there and hit him themselves. However, escaping was their top priority at the moment. Even so, Akainu's blabbering about how their father was a complete failure just because he had never defeated G.O.L.D. Roger nor became the pirate king himself, made them all gritting their teeth in anger. Ever since Ace was a child, he never threw a fit or lost his temper so badly. Even when he got cursed to death by the people that hated his blood father back then, the only thing that he did was to glare at them back and walk away. He was taught better to never succumb to his negative emotions. But right now, Ace was tired, both mentally and physically, and he could still feel the pain from his torture and impel down. The insults thrown at Whitebeard was the last thing that made him lose his temper as he threw his rationality aside and ignored the warnings of the others as he recklessly charged forward towards Akainu in a fit of fury. All of these could be seen by not only those in Marieford, but also those who were still watching the live battle in Sabadi Archipelago. This year's name is Whitebeard. Ace declared as he threw a fist of flame to Akainu, who then received his punch with his own fist of magma. As their fists met, Ace's arm got caught in fire that gave him pain, much to the other's surprise. Akainu, who was pleased with the outcome, proceeded to mock Ace's own carelessness and foolishness for thinking that his mere flame could actually beat his magma. A fire couldn't possibly burn a lava. Ace. Luffy, who was worried over his big brother, wanted to go to his side. But when he accidentally dropped the small piece of Ace's Viva card, he wanted to pick it up but his body gave up on him and he eventually dropped to the ground, feeling extreme exhaustion. Jibei worriedly stated that his body had already reached his limit. Pirate King, G.O.L.D. Roger, and Revolutionary Dragon. To think that their sons are sworn brothers, 
such a terrifying situation. Akaina added. Just your blood alone is a sin, let alone your existence. Even if I let the others get away, I will never let the two of you go. Ace locked eyes with Akainu and suddenly felt a sense of dread when the admiral whispered something to him. When Akainu glanced sinisterly at his brother, his face went pale. No. The next thing that people saw was Admiral Sakazuki disappeared from their view, only to reappear once again with his magma first right in front of the wide-eyed straw hats Luffy who had let his guard down. Next thing they saw was Fire Fist Ace appeared between them as he tried to shield his brother with his own body. However, instead of a kind of landing a hit on either of them, the admiral was suddenly shoved to the other side by an unknown force. The man crashed straight into the rumbles of those ruined parts of Marieford. What just happened? Was what went through everyone's head. Even Ace was confused. The unexpected turn of event left everyone speechless as they wondered what the heck just happened. Even the likes of Whitebeard, Garp, and Sengoku were bewildered by what happened, not to mention Akaina himself. Garp narrowed his eyes slightly, wondering to himself if what happened to the mad dog had anything to do with a certain someone. Is it just me, or is the area getting misty? One of the marines questioned. The guy was right. Somehow, mist started to appear, covering the whole marine ford like a blanket. As time passed, the mist was thick enough to the point where they could hardly see the sky. The pirates and marines were getting tensed, wondering if this was the enemy's way of playing tricks on them. W.H. What is that? Buggy, who was still holding on to the Den Den Mushy that was recording everything, pointed his finger to the sky when he saw a huge silhouette that greatly resembled that of a bird. A very big bird. Five big birds to be exact. Akainu, who had just recovered from the shock, immediately fired a shot of magma towards the birds, only for them to dodge and disappear into the mist. Scared, the others moved away from the angry magma man. Reveal yourself. Silence. Then, a feminine chuckle could be heard all across the place. It's no good playing with fire, ya damn Sakazuki. A loud flapping sound of wings later swept away the mist, only to reveal a group of people riding huge birds respectively. There were six of them with four of them wearing a familiar white cloak with a spiral symbol on their back. They were also wearing a blank mask to cover their faces. One of the other two was wearing a gray cloak but with no mask. Even so, the person's face was completely hidden from view. The last one was obviously a woman with long raven hair, wearing her signature coat with the same symbol on the back, and her signature fox mask. The group landed right in front of Fire Fist Ace and his companions who were looking greatly pleased and excited for their appearances. Once they got off the birds, the birds then flew away, leaving the place. Akainu's eyes were blazing in extreme hatred as he locked eyes with the woman's bright eyes. Whitebeard smirked. Sengoku narrowed his eyes as he felt a headache coming. Garp simply picked his nose. The Sichibukai were surprised. Jinbei sighed in relief as he held on to Luffy who was gaping in surprise while Ace got this huge grin on his face as he stared at the group of people standing before him. Mainly, the woman in the middle. It was obvious to see that he was very familiar with the woman based on his reaction alone. Just like the rest. The Whitebird pirates sighed in relief when they recognized the newcomers. The marines and the clueless ones nervously shifted their eyes from the high-ranking admirals, to Sengoku and Garp, to those big shots from the New World and finally stopped on the newcomers, surprised or simply wondering who the hell were they. Those guys, who are they? Kobe, who was among the clueless ones asked. He was still a new recruit, therefore, he still lacked some knowledge about those from the New World. Plus, he had never seen any wanted posters with their appearances at all. A veteran who stood next to him heard the Pinkhead's question and kindly answered. The one in the middle is the Yuzukij, and she's the leader of the land of Yuzu. Yuzukij. Kobe's eyes widened in surprise as he realized who this person was. He had never seen her but he had heard of her when he was still a fresh newbie months ago. The one who called herself the Yuzukij, who was also the founder and leader of the Whirlpool Empire, or better known as Yuzu. The empire appeared from out of nowhere six years ago, and made a great reputation for itself. It could be said that up until today, nobody knew the Yuzukij's real name, her real appearance, and let alone her origin. 
The empire itself was famous and mostly known for its citizens. That was because it was a widely known knowledge among the people of Grand Line that the citizens of Yuzu were actually the former slaves that belonged to the world nobles. The Yuzukage made her appearance when she took over the ships that carried hundreds of slaves belonged to the world nobles six years ago. She only left those working for the world government with small boats and left behind a spiral mark as her symbol. It happened again when she attacked a lot of slave auction houses to free the slaves. After that, a bunch of papers had been spread and scattered to all over the Grand Line that stated who she was and how the former slaves had officially became her citizens in her newly arised empire. The empire was located on an island in the New World, surrounded by whirlpools. Thus its name, the Whirlpool Empire, or simply known as Yuzu. If Dragon was the world's worst criminal, then the Yuzukage was the world's most hated criminal by the world government. Aside from hurting the ego and pride of those so-called celestial beings, she also caused the marines to lose face several times, for they were unable to catch her no matter how hard they tried. Including Akainu, who was mainly in charge to capture her, only to be treated like an incapable fool by her. It was good to say that the Yuzukage was the only criminal that had ever escaped from Admiral Sakazuki's clutches again and again for the past six years. The Admiral's hatred towards the woman was understandable, since he was appointed by the world nobles themselves to capture the thorn of their sides. They even triggered the buster call on her island, but then they were also forced to suffer a huge loss when even a buster call wasn't enough to destroy her island due to a mysterious force that protected her island. Thus, they could only swallow their grievances and give up on their advances. Since she wasn't actually a pirate, nor did she commit any crime that involved harming them directly or harming anyone else, she wasn't considered that dangerous. That was until she had a conflict with Big Mom, and came out victorious as she left the Yonko's territory with not even a scratch on her person. That was when the world government realized how troublesome she would be if she became a pirate. Fortunately, it was rumored that she had a conflict with Big Mom because she rejected the Yonko's invitation to join her fleet, with the excuse that she wasn't interested in getting involved with piracy. The Marines were relieved, but it made them even more anxious and wary of her. It would be good if she would just stay still and stick with her words of not involving herself in piracy, because then the world government wouldn't have to worry that much about her. And even though she had a bad reputation among the world nobles, she was also viewed as a savior among the commoners, so they weren't able to do anything that was so obvious to her as it would only bring a bad reaction from the people that might tarnish the world government's reputation. In conclusion, the Yuzukage was a time bomb. But now, looking at the sudden appearance of the Yuzukage and her mysterious group of people that they had never seen before, they wondered why someone who wasn't even a pirate would be here and even seemed like she was protecting the pirates. What kind of relationship that she had with Whitebird for her to be here? What is the meaning of this? Sengoku snapped. Are you finally in cahoot with a Yonko now? Of course not. She answered nonchalantly, angering the fleet admiral even more. Then what are you even doing here? Do you even realize that you're helping a criminal? Akainu shouted. Displeasure written all over his face as he glared murderously at her. If he could, he would definitely go over there and burn her alive. But considering her weird abilities, Akaina stood still. He had the feeling that they would lose if this damn woman decided to side with the pirates. But how could she? She said it herself that she wouldn't get involved in piracy. A criminal? The person who stood next to her scoffed. The voice alone was enough to tell them that the person was a male. The man chuckled before he removed the hood that covered his head. I don't know what you're saying, but we're just here for our brothers. Our brothers. Two words that set an alarm in everyone's head excluded some. They were astonished to see a familiar face once the hood was removed. Ace and Luffy, along with a certain revolutionary, gasped in surprise. Sabo. Sabo Quinn? Sabo gave them a grin in response. Yo. Sabo, the infamous number two of the Revolutionary Army. At this point, the Marines really weren't that surprised to see another guy from the Revolutionary Army. But if he was here, then wouldn't it mean that Dragon and his army were coming? As if he could hear the thought of the Marines, Sabo smiled at them and said don't worry. Dragon-san is not coming. 
while the marines sighed in relief. Luffy gulped as he stared at Sabo before looking at the woman with the fox mask. Then that person. As many eyes focused on her, the woman grabbed her mask, and the mask suddenly disappeared into a poof of smoke, revealing a stunning face underneath. With three faint lines on each one of her cheeks, and her bright blue eyes, that was indeed his older sister who he hadn't seen in person for the past ten years. Nei Chan. Luffy cried out as he threw himself at her. Neru returned his hug happily. Ace just laughed when he was also being pulled into the group hug while Sabo just patted him on his shoulder. Upon seeing their leader removed her mask, the other four individuals also did the same. The first individual was a young man with a cunning look on his face. He had light blonde hair and a pair of green eyes. The second one was a young woman with short brown hair and a pair of hazel eyes. The woman smiled so widely as she revealed her teeth, swinging a sword over her shoulder as she scanned her surroundings. The next one was another young woman, but this one didn't have any expression on her face. With silvery long hair that was tied into a high ponytail, they could also see a small pair of wings that could only belong to a scypion. Her eyes were light blue and there was a hint of mocking in her gaze as she held on to a beautiful silver bow in her right hand. The last man was obviously older than his three companions, especially with the wrinkles under his eyes. But even so, he was still a handsome man with a big muscular body. With just a glance, everyone knew that he was the one with the strongest physical force among them. All four of them exchanged a silent communication with Nehru as they nodded their heads at her. Garp coughed awkwardly when several pairs of eyes stared at him as if to say you better explain this situation, especially from the intense stare that he got from Sengoku. Yehem. Have I ever mentioned before that I still have another grandkid? In return, Sengoku glared at him even harder. The nerve of this guy. Dragon has another child? And she's also the Yuzukage. What the heck? Like father, like daughter. And it looks like that Sabo guy is also a part of their family. At this point, nothing can surprise me anymore. That's a very messed up family, Garp San. You sure have a very interesting family, Garp. While Garp was being criticized by everyone else, the three brothers plus sister exchanged greetings with each other. Nei Chan. You came. Luffy cried out with tears streaming down his face. The others were perplexed to see a childish side of him after all the stunts that he pulled out, and his terrible reputation as he hugged his older sister like his life depended on her. Which it did, because if she didn't appear, Straw Hats Luffy and Fire Fist Ace would no doubt die at the hands of a Kaino by now. I knew you would come, Ace said. Happiness and relief radiated from his eyes as he felt that things were okay now as his sister was now by his side. Then he looked at the people that she brought and smirked knowingly. You guys came as well. The man with the light blonde hair smirked back at him and said well, today is the day. Then Ace looked at Sabo. But I didn't expect to see you here either. Sabo felt wronged. How could I not come when my brother is in trouble? Ace just laughed at him. Sabo glared at him before scolding Luffy. How long are you going to cry, Luffy? You're already this big and you're still crying like a brat? While Luffy gave his own response to Sable who was putting on a top hat from God knows where, Nera said nothing as she ruffled Luffy's hair as she tried to calm herself. Just a few more seconds, and she would have lost her two brothers. With a dark look, Nera looked over at Akainu. Unacceptable. Then she looked over to Whitebeard who was also looking at her, and they both shared a silent communication between them. Knowing his final wish, she merely nodded at him in respect. This action was naturally seen by the others, especially the Whitebeard pirates who silently lowered their heads, knowing exactly what happened. There's really no way? Ace asked, feeling dejected when she shook her head. So you're also Dragon's child? Akina suddenly interrupted them, grabbing everyone's attention to himself. The other four individuals instinctively moved closer to their leader as they watched the magma man walking towards them with a disgusted look on his face. As he walked, he left a trail of boiling magma on his track as his legs and arms were covered in hot magma. He was mad. Ace and Luffy, along with the other pirates immediately tensed, as they knew exactly how dangerous the man was. But seeing that Nehru was calm, they also calmed themselves. 
It was obvious that she didn't even put the raging Akainu in her eyes when she ignored him in favor of looking at the Den Den Mushi, knowing that the world was currently watching her. With a wide grin, she said my name is Monkey D. Nera. As you may know me, I am also the leader of Yuzu. As if on cue, the snail then changed its focus from Nera to the other mysterious four. Hide, the blonde-haired man said as he smiled hauntingly at them. He raised his right hand, and it immediately turned into mist. A devil fruit user. Now they knew who was responsible for the sudden mist. Yuzu. The swordswoman introduced herself arrogantly as she swung her sword and left a long, deep cut on the ground. Nailin you? The Skypian woman said simply. I am called Barlow. The last one said politely. And they are Yuzu's four generals. Nera stated proudly. Akina scowled. Does this mean that you have finally decided to side with the Whitebirds? Nera chuckled. Don't get me wrong. Like Sabo said, we're only here for our brothers, and we have nothing to do with the Whitebeard pirates. But you do owe me for almost killing them, Sakazuki. As soon as she finished her words, her smiling face was gone as she sneered at him. Everyone turned cold when they sensed a frightening aura coming from her. I would be a bad brother if I didn't come to save their sorry ass. Sabo said as he shrugged his shoulders, earning a glare from Ace and a cheer from Luffy. On the other side, Sengoku clicked his tongue in annoyance. To think that a bunch of frightening individuals were raised together. Garp. What the heck were you thinking? Every single one of your family members only knows how to cause trouble. How could a marine hero have a family full of outlaws? Bwahahahaha. Don't worry. From now on, whatever they are doing is none of my business. Garp said cheerfully. Neru and her brothers only let out a sigh as they were already used to their grandfather's attitude. That's good. Then I will kill them myself. Akainu suddenly declared. Then he moved. Nero also moved. Blinding yellow light clashed with fiery red inferno. Something was heading to Whitebeard. Whitebeard attacked. Marineford shook.